You kind of like went from you know, accepting a uh, pre existing basket of uh, food stuffs you know, for a vendor who's interested in buying a catering for a school bus district to uh, and then the next half one, half one except tickets to go to the Jules game. So it's obvious, you know, that's a certain point of the cost of one. Why is there a certain point? You have to think more. Well, and obviously, except the GPT. Do I need to sign something? Yeah. 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 So technically, uh, as far as furniture, I would have run around with the uh, as long as I don't accept regular or you know, dinner and stuff. Uh, that's Okay, let's get started here. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the April 18th, 2024 West Goshen Township Board of Supervisors meeting. We'll begin the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Can you please stand? Obviously, as many of you know, we had to shift our regular meeting time to tonight. So I apologize if anybody showed up on Tuesday. Um, we went to the PSATS conference, and uh, we all had, I think, a really nice time at the conference. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else here did, too. Um, okay. 
So I would like to make an announcement first uh, that this meeting may be audio and video recorded by third parties and also there are agendas available at the back of the room. If you don't have an agenda, you can feel free to grab one. And that will lead us into uh, public comment. So if anybody is here tonight that would like to make a comment about an issue that's not on tonight's agenda, you can have to do that now. Yes, Dr. White. Good evening, everyone. Doug White, West Christian Township. Uh, I have uh, four items. Uh, first one is um, I would uh, be in favor of the exploration and possible impl implementation of a budget advisory committee solely for the purpose of increased structured support or increased structured participation of residents who are, would be so interested and only w doing this while preserving the uh, a privacy of the staff and having the Board of Supervisors having the ultimate authority. That's my first comment. And the, sec the next three are some uh, special acknowledgments and honorable mentions. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Jim Jenkins. We lost Jim um, about a year or so ago, which brought to my attention. Uh, Jim Jenkins was a, uh, otherwise known as the Voice of the Goshen Fair. Um, he was uh, a township uh, supervisor in East Nantmale Township for 18 years and was a township resident in the 60s and 70s and a great uh, friend of my dad. They had many conversations about the township and, West, and, and supervisory. Jim Jenkins, blessed memory, may you rest in peace. I would also like to um, make an honorable mention. We lost uh, Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut. Joe, Senator Lieberman was a, a great leader. Um, he stood by his convictions and a strong, staunch supporter of the state of Israel. Of blessed memory, may he rest in peace, Senator Joe Lieberman. Also, an honorable mention to Senator John Fetterman. John Fetterman, thank you, sir your staunch support of the state of Israel and you, our United States of America. Thank you, Senator John Fetterman, your unwavering support. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Are there any other comments? Yes, Mr. Bolin. Good evening, Charlie Gold, Vice Commission. Uh, four issues as well, just follow up on some of the things that we're discussing here at the Board of Supervisors, uh, the EV charging stations, is there a status on that? You mean the EV ordinance that yes. we've been discussing? Yes. So the status, I believe, is that it's supposed to appear before the Planning Commission. Is that right? Which yeah. it did. It did. It, it went did. to the Planning Commission at their meeting on April 9th. Okay, and I think that they had some feedback. I think that a few members of the Planning Commission are going to attend the Sustainability Advisory Committee meeting. That's correct. And it'll, yes, next Tuesday, and it'll be discussed there, and some of the questions that have been brought up um, will be addressed at that meeting as well. And it will be on the agenda for the next, for the May Planning Commission meeting for the Planning Commission to make any recommendations they feel back to the board. There was no action taken at the last meeting that you were at. Uh, that's great news. And is the county reviewing that as well? The county, the county did review that and did provide comments, and those comments were include. I believe they were included in the meeting materials from the last, from the April second board meeting. But if not, they can be provided. But the county did review it accordingly. Okay, I'll look through this. Thank you. Um, by any chance, is it following? the Pennsylvania DOT EV model ordinance toolkit. Is that some of the source material? I know that we, we as in the board and the sustainability advisory committee did reference that toolkit. Okay. And will you be open to the suggestion to throw out section uh, B4, which has to do with the new single family units being covered under this ordinance. So 
because this ordinance is not finalized, I think anything is up for consideration. And again, we're going to be discussing that at the Sustainability Advisory Committee meeting next Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple more things. The solar panel, how is the solar panel project? Do we have an update on that? I'm going to defer to maybe Mr. Walsh. I know that Mr. Walsh has been in communications about that. Well, I would have passed to Chris first. Like <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, our uh, Kirsten Isaac from Keystone Engineering Group is doing her due diligence on the bid, and that should be reported back to the board at the May 7th meeting. Okay. And um, do you know if the bid separated the power contribution by areas such as each roof? And I ask that question because the largest area is facing northwest, which is a evening sun, uh, probably the least contributing. The other two are, are facing southeast, southwest. And do you know if the bid broke that out by area? I cannot answer that question. Okay. And the location of the meter tie-in, um, has that been resolved and is there an impact on the cost or the proposal? So uh, that has not been resolved. That is a key question is still open. The assumption was it could be tied into uh, building these power system. Um, but in reviewing the information, we need further guidance because it would be a PICO as to which, it, which account is the best one to tie into. So there would be a difference in cost, but there would also be a difference in benefit. So. Okay, thank you, Sean. Last question, Barker Park. Trees versus deer habitat. Has the contract been signed for planting the trees and are we taking out the north part of the uh, park shrubs that is a deer habitat. So again, um, I'm not entire, I'm not recalling if we signed anything with Stroud Water Research Center, I guess we did. The board approved the landowner agreement. Okay. Um, as far as deer habitat, it's obviously something that I think is going to be considered as we go in there, but again, this is the removal of vegetation that's problematic in that area. Um, so, I'm very concerned about that. It's not problematic for the deer. Somebody needs to go over and walk through that area. That is where they go to hide when they're being chased. They, they, they migrate through there. They stay there. <laughs> We're going to take that deer habitat out and plant trees. I think the deer lose in that deal. And that's what's in the agreement. I hear your concerns, and actually, I don't think that you're going to find anybody who's more um, empathetic about deer than I am. Um, I agree with you. I think that that habitat needs to be protected. The deer issue is um, an interesting one in this township. I don't know if you've been following kind of some of the discussions that we've been having over the past couple of years about, for example, the Greystone community and the deer there. Um, you know, we've had complaints about the deer population. I'm not saying that this particular project, you know, has anything really to do with that, but I, I understand what you're saying. Can the board agree at least to go look at what I'm talking about and agree to modify the agreement for planting those trees if in fact they find that yes, there's signs that deer are there? I invite you to attend the sustainability committee meeting because I, I think that that's a good question and it's something that might be a good discussion at that meeting. And I know you're also interested in the EV ordinance stuff, so I think that maybe you should come to that meeting. And I would, but it seems that it's passed then. An agreement's already been signed. There's a contract for those people to take that area out and plant trees. I just want to say I think it's always good to voice your opinion and come to the meeting and try and hear your viewpoint because sometimes people can be tunnel vision and not look outside of that. So I would encourage you to come and, and voice your opinion. But the contract's already signed. The agreement is already signed. The contract is already signed, but the vegetation hasn't been removed yet. And I don't think that Stroud Water Research Center is the kind of institution that's going to ignore our requests. Or modify them if we have good reason to. Would the board make that request? I will personally go out to Barker Park to look at what you're talking about. And if, if 
the board deems necessary of what you're asking, then maybe we can entertain it. I can't answer that right now, though. Okay. I mean, it's, it's as far as I have to go to. Yeah. I mean, you're asking a personal question of the board in terms of what sort of individual position I, I have less sympathy than Ms. Garnier for the dear situation in West Goshen. Um, but I not really don't really feel the need to weigh in on the process of determining if we need to remove that vegetation as per their suggestion from Stroud or whether it stays and some modified plan occurs, it's, it's not a burning issue for me. Okay. It's not like we're taking shrubbery down and putting the parking lot or something. I mean, we're putting trees in. So that's what we're interested in doing. We're trying to maintain that area. Okay. Dear Luz, I get it. Dear will not lose. Dear will you seen, Dear you, you haven't seen, seen this. You haven't been there, you haven't looked at it. I'm very familiar with the park, the park area now. The West Town community and all the trees and all that are back in that whole area. The acres and acres of West Town school owners. And there's a huge herd back there. And they move around. They're very adaptable, Charlie. You know that. Okay. It's a good question. And I agree with you. And I believe me, I would love more deer habitat. Natural deer habitat. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I have three questions. I'm just, I'm just curious. Uh, regarding um, the Wawa and the rejection of unconditional use, has there uh, been any information regarding if they've appealed it uh, to the, I guess, the county? It would be the next level. Um. So. Whispering. I have to be careful when I say. Yeah, I'll defer to our solicitor on that. So it's our it's my understanding that the that appeal has been filed. Okay. I've not seen it yet. Okay. Um, and my office was checking quite a bit today to make sure that it would come in. So that one has been filed actually just learned of moments ago. So um, we'll look forward to looking at that appeal and wrapping accordingly. And, and moving forward, is there communication to the residents that it has been appealed? Uh, like the residents of York County Avenue. So the the uh, the rules of procedure dictate that they would notify anyone who has a party status from the uh, from the underlying proceedings. Um, so to the extent that there are parties, they would receive notice, but there would not ordinarily be just a general public notice. It would only be for the people that attended the meeting then. Yeah. Uh, the party no. status, which I believe you yeah. do have, I do have and, and many of your neighbors. Okay. Yeah. So uh, and just. For fair warning, the way this usually works is the appeal is filed with the Court of Common Pleas by within 30 days. Uh, if it was filed today, it's timely. It doesn't need to be served on you until after it's filed. So they would file it with the court and then they would mail it to you um, or potentially have it delivered to your home. So uh, so that's how you're going to receive notice of it. You should receive it in the next several days. Okay, thank you. Uh, number two, um, the surveyors were out at Parkway Shopping Center again yesterday. And so I had the opportunity of driving up to them and asking them who they're doing for the, the work for. Of course, their first comment to me was, we're not doing it for Wawa, we're doing it for the state. Uh, now my question to you guys is, uh, is there any communication with uh, the township and the state as to when they're going to be surveying, or do, do they just come out and survey? I can't answer that one. They, uh, the state did send letters to property owners last year regarding the TVRPC project. About the right away? The right away. That's what they were doing. Okay. So that was the notification from the letters that were sent last year for the work for the 202 interchange. Okay. Right there. Okay. So they, they're surveying to identify areas, but my understanding is the project is all going to be from 202 and south, nothing north. But they may change the project. That's what's on the tip. Yeah. But that may be what PennDOT brings forward as a project when they finally get the design. And based on the surveyors, they were nice enough to tell me that when they do this, it's typically two to five years before anything happens, really. So, and that's good. Um, another topic that's dear to my heart, and it's unfortunate, was on the 23rd of March, uh, we had a sewer backup, as you guys are aware of. And I'm a little, um, I'm a little disappointed uh, as a resident about the answer that I heard from Mike Maffa regarding what had transpired. I'm not a sewer guy, but I know a little about geometry, and I'm not, I'm not understanding how this subterranean cover fell in the hole. 
Um, and I'll use a little analogy. When I cook food, if I have too small of a lid on a pot, the lid falls in the pot. If I have too large of a lid, it can either stay on the pot or it can fall off if I knock it. If I have the right lid, it typically stays there. Um, the other part I'm not too happy about is communication. Um, I want to thank uh, Ashley Miscogne for uh, getting back to me that day and calling some people. But I heard, and, and this is only what I heard from my neighbors, I was fortunate. Let me just back up. I was fortunate enough to be home. I happened to be right by my basement. I have a basement drain. And I was there doing plumbing work. And all of a sudden, I saw water spewing up. And I'm like, mother of God, what is going on? Then I smelled it. And um, I'm, thank God I'm a little MacGyver-ish and, and was able to react quickly. But, and I didn't lose anything, except I lost many days cleaning. Uh, my neighbors were, my, especially Marcia Smith, who's very unfortunate. It was a mess. And she's telling me, and I'm hearing from other people, that the answer was, call your insurance company. Um, I know we have insure homeowners insurance. Some people have that declaration for sewer backup, some don't. But I, I believe that answer is really inappropriate. Um, they pay for a service, okay, and that being sewer service and trash review. And to get an answer like that is just, that makes me mad, you know? And the other thing is I didn't hear, seemed like no empathy, um, like nobody cared. Uh, I care, and I care about you know, what goes on. I care about other, other regions in the township because this could happen somewhere else. It could happen in, in uh, Glen Acres. It could happen over in Roslyn, uh, but it just happened over a dark place. I don't know if it was a lack of maintenance, uh, maybe unlawfulness. Um, I'm a, I was born in a city. When I was 15 years old, 14 years old, I knew how to take a manhole cover. I knew how to stuff leaves down the sewer and clog the sewer, you know? Um, so for, for what happened that day, you guys can't imagine unless you were there. And, and it, it was really crappy. And I'm not making a pun, you know? So I'd like to hear a little more. I'm, I'm concerned about infrastructure. It is what I'm getting at. And I'm concerned about storm drains and sewer. I know we've already had an electrical problem over in that neighborhood. I've had my triplex replaced because it was worn out. My neighbor had their triplex. I know it's unrelated to what occurred from a, you know, it's sewer, but it's an infrastructure thing. And how are we gonna prevent it again? And, and is that what really happened? You know, that's all I have, okay? Thank you. Thank you, and um, so first I wanna say that that was a terrible situation, and I did speak with you and a few of your neighbors about it, um, and obviously that's, something that we never want to see happen to anybody living in this township. Um, I actually have not had the chance to have a discussion with the board because of the Sunshine Law about this specific issue. Um, I don't know if Chris or Brian want to elaborate on exactly what happened and how we're going to prevent this from happening again. Um, and also, speak a little bit to how Mr. Mayor's feeling about lack of communication or empathy from the township. Who wants to, who wants to kick it off, Brian? <laughs> well, I heard about this well after it happened. This is something that was handled through the sewer and their sewer engineer, so I don't typically get involved with sanitary sewer other than to pass information on to the sewer authority or to HRG, their engineer. So I was not aware of the details. I just knew there was a backup. I, I'm hearing more details about what I've heard to, to this point, because it's not something I'm normally involved with. I would suggest that our next sewer meeting, that you come to the sewer meeting, uh, the sewer authority meeting, and discuss it, and you will get more technical details than you'll ever want. Um, they're very good at it. So you may have talked to Mike, but you're be in front of the whole board at that point. So we can take as much time as you need for that. 
Yes. Well, and just, you did come, right? You came the last week. I did come. Yeah. So we, we, Mike gave a very brief overview as to how this got Yeah, and I had talked to Mike. You know, I don't know anything about the sewer, but he did explain that there was a, you know, a cover that fell. Uh, the system is under pressure from the pump on spruce. Um, but, you know, and I came to the meeting, and I really, I wanted to just listen, really, to come to the meeting. I didn't want to say anything. I just wanted to hear what was going on. There were a lot of acronyms, a lot of things going on, and I, I didn't say much, you know. But Mike knew I was there because he asked if I was there. I told him I would come. But I, I, I just, you know, waited to, to think about it a little more, and it, it, I just don't buy, I don't buy the subterranean cover falling in there. Unless, the only way that thing falls in there is if it's broken, splits in half, and then goes in there. And, and then my concern is, it's probably been, if that has happened, it's been in there a while, and it's probably built up over time to create a problem. And it just came to fruition that day. I think, I think the best thing to do is talk to Mike because Mike, I don't remember the exact words he used, but they're like he's been in the sewer yeah. system for a long time. So there's right. one other occurrence of this in 20 years. So it's not a very frequent event. And he gave an explanation as to why they got dislodged and fallen in and blocked the outlet, which causes the backup. So, of course, we all accept, accepted it at the meeting. So I think come to the next meeting, like Tina suggested, and let's have okay. a deeper conversation on yeah. it. Yeah. See, see if it's if it's a real obvious reason why it got dislodged. I think he mentioned rain events and stuff that caused kind of a right. displacement of it. So you get a better clarity there. Let's talk to Mike about what he did communication-wise and what could be improved. Yeah, and he did talk about it's very difficult to view to do maintenance on that also. So I think we need to delve into that also on some of the maintenance and why we can't inspect that because of where it's located and the purpose of it. So. Um, Let's have a long conversation about it next week. So yeah, we'll next week. I'll show it. Beginning of the year, beginning of the month. I also don't want to kick the can back and forth between Mike Maffa and the board. I think Mike was pretty clear about um, that this is a policy sort of decision and it's up to the board if there's any action that we as a township do want to take on this. And I don't know, I mean, I think those conversations even legally maybe need to happen, but um, I do question whether there's something that the township is able to do because I know that your neighbor, for example, lost a lot of stuff. Um, and this is, it was an accident. I, I, I'm assuming it was an accident. I don't know. Malfunction of this particular part of the service system. But it did affect you and, and I do care about that. And so I think that maybe we can have some conversations about what we can do as a township. Um, yeah, nothing's perfect. I understand that things break, you know, whether it be that or something or a personal one. Um, but, you know, and everybody has different situations, but when they have a dumpster there, they got a pod there, and they're just really, you know, like at least, at least I, I, I call, the sewer trash, hey, can I put a couple extra pieces out, you know, to get rid of? Sure, no problem. Um, but some people are proactive in that way. At least reach out to them and say, hey, because of what happened, maybe, you know, you could um, give them a special day or something just to help them out a little. Because um, everybody's different. Um, and we have another neighbor, they get very distasteful. And they talk about legal action. I'm like, yo. Just stop. You know, you got to talk about it first. Well, your neighbor, Ms. Smith, did contact me. Yeah. And the appropriate course of action is to go through your homeowner's insurance. And they would go, yes, that is the appropriate course of action. Then they would do something called subrogation. Okay. Or then they would then contact township's insurance. Is that correct, Eric? That's yeah, I was just going to say That's correct. That. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> they would then uh, contact the township's insurance. I did forward Ms. Smith's information to our insurance company. I do not know if those con if additional conversations have occurred, but it is our on our property and liability insurance company's radar. Okay. Okay, I didn't know that, Chris. So yeah, I appreciate that you was, doing that. That was a very that was a recent occurrence. Okay, I appreciate you doing that. Okay. Um, but I there, agree. there are other people, but I don't want to get into it. This is not the time to replace. Going through going through your own property insurance is the appropriate okay. course of action. Thank you. And no problem. 
Any other public comment tonight? Okay, hearing none, we move on to item number four, which is the discussion and possible approval of a proposal from Snyder Environmental Services Incorporated for lining 15 inch storm sewer pipe in the Fresh Meadows development. And I will turn this over to Mr. Bajor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before the board this evening is a proposal from Snyder Environmental Services to complete the lining of 15 inch storm sewer pipe in the Fresh Meadows development. Um, by way of background information, this company was used by the township in the past for the Legion Drive project in 2022. Uh, the Streets Department has been undertaking the replacement of CMP in the Fresh Meadows development. And to date, I actually think this is higher from when I wrote this, they were, they've replaced 120 feet of CMP with HDP pipe. Is it more than that at this point, Mark? Well, up to about 200. Up to about 200, so they are moving along. Um, but Mark had notified us that there was a mismarked Pico gas main and service lines that were discovered after the project was underway. Um, so based on this, he is recommending that the CMP in this section, and Brian has brought it up on the screen so that the board can see it, um, be lined for safety reasons. Uh, since we've worked with them in the past, Mark reached out to Snyder Environmental Services, who's provided a proposal in the amount of $47,643.75. They are a CoStars vendor, and if approved, the cost for this work would be paid from the American Rescue Fund. Um, we provided some pictures of the work that was done on Legion Drive to kind of show what would be involved, because it would be a similar type process. Um, and we're recommending lining in this, in this location for uh, safety reasons. Okay, thank you. Does the board have any questions or comments on this proposal? I have one. Sure. sure. Um, I understand, you know, it was mismarked um, Pico gas mean. Shouldn't Pico be paying for that and then we can use the money, the American Rescue Fund money, for something else since it was mismarked? Well, pencil. So we did a one call for it. Right. The one call came out for They, um, they mismarked it. Whenever there's a gas line there, I don't call salt. They can do a salt. They can find that gas line. Right. You could not find that gas line. So thank God you weren't digging. He called the day one call. Rep called his supervisor. He came out and marked it again. We still had salt that down there. Couldn't find his mark. So they were then going to call Pico themselves to mark it. And uh, Pico marked it, but at that point, we were just like, let's move. Well, yeah, paid one or Pico or both. I, I just think it's worth pursuing for that much amount of money. It's a lot of money, and we can be using that in other resources. Um, you know, at least try to, to go after them to say that they have to have markings. I mean, that's required. I think what Pico would do at this point is say, we now mark the line, go ahead and pay. But I'm not feeling really confident. PA one call guy got that he even said our plans for this part of the neighborhood is not very comfortable. So that's not a good comfort level. No. Even now to do anything further. Well, what we're finding out the lower side of fresh meadows does not have gas. Do we feel comfortable proceeding with this project, knowing that we don't have very well Pico markings? Well, if we do see another gas line crossing, we're going to get softly out there again and have them reveal the gas line before we put an escalator in the ground. Well, let me ask you, what's the alternative to, to relining this particular piece of storm that would be digging it up and replacing it? Well, I would probably call soft dig again and find that gas line. I believe there's, I believe there's two gas lines. There's a six inch main, and there's also service lines you're crossing a couple times. Well, I mean, and, and they don't mark the service lines. So, all the house, so if you see the map, this little white square on the highway, that's where the sinkholes are. That's where we have the pipe washed out where the pipe has collapsed. And it, it appears by looking at the sinkhole, that's where when Pico was boring the gas line right down the back side of the curb line, they hit the bottom of our pipe, our metal pipe. So, our pipe is sitting on top of the gas line. And 
that. The pipe runs right behind the, from the there's a, the pipe runs right behind the, the um, curb line that ends up in this inlet. So it kind of runs in a, in a diagonal to this inlet. The, the main goes in and out underneath the curb line. It's behind it, it's in front of it, behind it, it's in front of it, and it comes down between these two houses. So it comes down in this area. So we actually cross it multiple times. The six inch yeah, like, that we move next yeah, So we're based we're upon the most recent mark out from Pico, we cross it multiple times. And then can you show us where the, uh, the CMP is crossing over right now? Well, in this area, it's sitting right on top of it. That's the area that's open. But based on the markings, it comes, it's behind the curb lines, in front of the curb line, and it kind of comes in and out of this curb line right here, and then it follows down the road. It's not necessarily straight, it was getting bored, so it kind of moved a little bit. So, Mark, why aren't you confident with the markings that they gave you in, the, in that respect of kind of that curvy? Well, we could not, when we hired Salt, they could find the BS line before we estimated we could not find the BS line. So, we did, we had to do it twice. We could not find it. And then Pico came out like two or three days later and marked it. But at that point, we decided to. Transformers, the square right here. These are the transformers. It sounds like we need to get Pico out there, and they destroyed that. That they're what caused all of this too. So they should be no put on notice. Yeah, but it was something like well, how many years ago? Now? We don't know that's true. We don't know whether that original yeah. storm line was installed with a proper stone base, what corrosion has been. It's irrelevant to when the gas line was put. Before. You really would never have a true. This is what caused it. Outcome from this. I really respect what Mark's saying in terms of why take risks. Yeah, no, yeah that's so my point. This yeah. is the way forward is to line it and not get into a lot of back and forth trying to use soft dig to really identify it or redo it. It's just, especially if it's crisscrossing several times, if that's the belief, then just do it, it, go with this method of lining the pipe and solve the problem. Because mm -hmm. the alternative would be to dig it up yeah, and keep running into rupturing the line. Yeah. But you don't want to take that chance. Um, so do you have another comment, Mark? You know, we're going to have to line other areas, too. There's areas where we're going to have to cross the 24 inch above that line. We're not going to dig in that, so we're going to have to line that, too. So there are going to be areas we're going to have to line. This is my Okay, do we anticipate any um, bypass pumping that's going to occur here? Will have to occur here? Okay. And then also, um, are we going to do a low pressure air test? Um, in the end? Um, I don't think so. You don't think we'll have a need to work? You don't normally test pressure test storm pipe because it's not under pressure. You pressure test any pipes that are under pressure or sanitary because of leaching, but you don't. There's not a pressure test done in the storm sort of pipes. Okay. We'll do a video inspection. After, okay. Yeah. There'll be one solid piece of PVC. So what I have here is this is some of the pictures from Legion. So this is the end where they put the, where they're pulling down to. Mm -hmm. This is where they pull the pipe down to. This is the pipe being fed down. So it's heated. It's a truck back here, it's your steam truck. It's heated and folded up and pulled. So this is getting pulled around the, this gets it, is, this is the pulley that's getting pulled around that and up. So, they pull, they're, so they're pulling it. So in this picture here is where they're actually pulling the softened pipe. Once they open the doors and start pulling the pipe out of the truck, they have five minutes. And they have to be done. Because it, it hardens that fast. And that's the material you showed us a piece that. No, that's a different material. It's uh, similar but different. The one at piece that is chemically, is to use the chemical. Yeah. This is okay. just steam to soften it. Okay. And then they pull, when they pull it through at the end, then they put it, they inflate it and blow it up. And that's where it goes out and inflates and becomes the pipe. Right. And then at the very end, they trim it off, and then this is what it looks like when it's done. You trim it off in line pipe. So that's, very that's the process that they're going to be doing. And they're going to pull it from the street all the way down, as I believe they talked about. They did that about six hours. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, it'll be there it'll be one day and they're done. Wow. 
there's a lot of equipment that comes in because of the trucks and all the different things that come in. There's a big train down the street. But it's because they rolled the, the reels are in the trucks being steam heated. And they pull the they do a reel at a time. And the plan is to pull, let's see, let me just pull out a little bit because you'll see it. There's an inlet. It's hard to see because it's up a little bit further. Is it up further yet, Mark? The inlet? It's right in here, isn't it? Yeah. There's an inlet up here. We're going to start at that inlet and make it a little further and pull all the way through down to this inlet. And then we're also going to pull because of going through yards and not digging it up. We're also going to line pipe that goes from the street to this end wall here where we line at the same time. So we're actually lining two runs of pipe. Because they pull one and they pull the second. They can't pull through because of the angle. So we two pull. That's two, two setups and two pulls for that price. And they can do two pulls a day. They can't pull any more than twice a day because of how much time it takes to set up and eat it. Mm -hmm. If you replace the ADP already, you fix one of all of that in the back. So they'll rely on that. What's the, uh, what's the lifespan of this uh, lighting project? I'm telling you 50 years. 50 years? Mark, have there been any issues with the work that was done on Legion Drive? Seems like a good thing. So to it yes. may outlast you, John. Mark, I just want to follow up on a conversation we had earlier this week when I was out with PSATs and seeing some of the exhibits and the vendors there. So given that we're going to need more of this uh, process to use throughout Fresh Meadows as you get further on and further along in the work, um, Coastal is good that you know there are approved vendors here. You don't need to do the normal bidding process once you get over the 23,200 or whatever it is. But I think we should take the time to get three prices from co-stars vendors that can do this work. I know we're, we like Snyder, they did a great job on Legion Drive, and if, if there's a reason you believe we need to move on with this quickly at this point, please tell me. Uh, but I think going forward, we really need to get um, some competitive pricing. You may still want to select Snyder, but just to confirm that that price is, you know, other people can't beat it by $10,000 or something else. So. Um, Again, we'd only be looking at co-stars and group vendors to, to get the pricing from. So I don't know if you have any updates or thoughts about what, what you want to do here, whether you feel that you want to advocate for just using Snyder and then look at others to you know, get some pricing for different parts of fresh meadows as you get further along, but let me know. Personally, I mean, I agree getting a few more prices is a good idea. I think we are moved along where I think I'm comfortable with just having Snyder. So what, um, I guess, steps have you taken already? When you say you're moved along on this, is this like a project that's ready to go and things have already been sort of set in motion? It pretty much is. We just got to get the okay from the homeowners to have that retention on. Um, but Snyder, they seem to tell us that they can have us on the schedule right now. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I think it's up to the board. Um, if this is something that you know we can go with Snyder for this project at forty-seven thousand dollars to do these two separate linings, and you're comfortable with that price, then we can go ahead and approve it with the understanding that with the next project we can maybe reach out to some of those vendors that we saw at PSATS. Or the alternative is to put a hold on this for now and get some more bids. Um, I don't know. And I don't even know if you would be able to speculate as to kind of the range between cost between these two different or three different vendors and the different materials that they use. <coughs> if it would be something like ten thousand dollars, if it would only be a couple thousand dollars, <coughs> I don't know if you know the answer. I think it's going to probably be between five thousand, five thousand dollars. It's going to be mobilization probably. Okay. I guess my question is: Is it going to hurt? to discuss this at the next meeting and vote on it another month? Will it change the position of the project at all or make it worse in waiting another month and getting bids between now and then? If you can, if, can you acquire bids between now and the next board meeting? Um, I don't know. I mean, Snyder's ready to go. We're moving, we're doing other areas. So, I mean, this can wait. It's not like Snyder has us on her schedule pretty much. If I reach out to the company called Insight, I gotta we're gonna have to come from Pittsburgh and have to look at it. Um, Snyder came from West Virginia, so but it can be done. Uh, Mark, what if it's worth 
worth and on Coast Dodge you can do one of those bid forms, just complete it and say, look, you're looking for pricing for foot for the, the 15 inch Nova Nova form. And just and that's the bulk of the cost here. Like you said, you'd only be saving maybe a bit on mobilization or whatever else. So if you, I'm sure they give you is what they the quote for the actual per foot install Nova form cost, and then you can compare it to the quote from Schneider and have a good feeling that this is a pretty good quote. Would you agree? Yeah. I think it's just worth doing a little bit more work to confirm that this is a good price because then we'll have the confidence that we've got what we need to do and Snyder's someone you've got experience with. And then we'll know for future projects. We'll get the, we'll get the homework done now rather than later is basically what we're saying because we need it anyway. Snyder did excellent work. <coughs> Okay. But again, this isn't about if you get a bit that's two thousand dollars less that we want you to go with someone less. If you say, look, I was I've got a price, but I don't think X, Y, and Z. I feel more comfortable for the kind of issues you've raised already on this project. I want to stay with Snyder because of the track record in this township. I'd be fine with that. Well, to push back though a little bit, I mean, he is confident with Snyder. I don't know if you are. You probably are familiar with the other vendors that. Provide these services? Actually, I'm not. You're not. So that's why I feel it's worth for the first one to get a competitive price, just to make sure we're not. Right, but if they come in two or three thousand dollars lower, and we've never worked with them, and we don't know if they have done anything in the township or have done a good job, are we willing to spend just that amount less? And yeah. go with an unknown than to spend the extra three and go with Snyder who's done yeah, work. I, I would say go with Snyder. There's the whole beauty of Coast Dodge. You don't have to go with the lowest bid, you go with the one that is the best value for you and that you believe is good. What I don't have now is any confidence of whether 47000 is the right price for this job, given the range of quotes we get for all of the kinds of projects. Well, I'm just honest that I can do this for 30000 and they're a good track record company, and you follow up and say, you should be trying that. So until we get a competitive, until we get pricing that says, but the range is only three or four thousand dollars here. I don't I have nothing to compare it to. I mean, the Legion Drive, I believe, is sixty, maybe eighty, and that was twenty-five thousand dollars over twenty-four inch. This is through over three hundred and fifty. I believe it's gonna be a good price, I just yeah. need the data. Okay. Well I respect that, so that's fine. If that's what the board wants to do, John. What? Is this proposal from Snyder, is it time locked? It says here it's only moving 15 days from the, uh, the date of the proposal, which is April the 2nd. So are we running into a time, uh, time uh, lock? So that Snyder may come back and leave a timber price. Uh, I, I, this is an appropriate point to point out that uh, there are a handful of the commercial terms that have been attached that uh, we'll need to adjust anyway. So I, I don't think that you're in a position to simply accept this as is, for example, uh, the jurisdiction and venue, um, I, I would not like to uh, resolve a dispute arising under this contract in Jefferson County, uh, West Virginia. So uh, that not least would be one item that we need to resolve with Snyder before we can accept this contract. Um, so uh, so it, to that extent, I would not describe this as acceptable in its current form, um, but it's close, and it's certainly close enough to negotiate and finalize some of those terms with Snyder. Um, that would be my suggestion, is to take the time to get the additional pricing data, adjust those terms so that Snyder, we understand that they're comfortable with those adjustments, um, and then you can take action on it at a subsequent meeting. That's also a good point. It does say, according to Snyder's uh, proposal, that they would be testing, low pressure test, air test will be conducted. So we just need a clarification. No, exclusions, they're excluded. Anyway, um, if there are issues with the contract that Ari thinks that we need to look at, then I think that we need to look at those anyway. And so if, if we're running on this time, sort of crunch with this 15-day window, and we have the opportunity to reach out to other vendors and get some more bids. I guess that's the direction that we want to move in. What's the issue with the contract? Uh, well, like I say, the dispute resolution has us uh, resolving 
adjudication concerning this contract in Jefferson County, West Virginia, which I presume is where Snyder is based. Um, and that's a common thing for this type of outfit to do. They would include a provision like that. Um, we would want any kind of dispute resolution to occur here because this is where the project's occurring, um, where witnesses would be and so forth. So that kind of term, I don't imagine that Snyder is really going to actually object to modifying it, but it does need to get modified before the final contract's signed and approved by the board. Um, so what number is that, Harry? Uh, so that would be, uh, it's actually the very last item uh, above agreed and accepted, uh, and the, if you accept the terms and conditions. Um, yeah, also, Harry, we've directed Kristen for all these contracts to have mutual indemnifications, right. too, not just one way, but both ways for the negligence clause. So those are, you did, you, I agree there are two or three terms that probably need to be discussed. Right. Discussed with the proposal, and if they, they would agree to change them. Okay. So we have some direction. I mean, I really think it's, if we can get this ironed out in the next couple of weeks here before the May 7th meeting, get some prices through co-stars from a couple of other little vendors and give you the approval there. Okay. And this will be on our May 7th yep. agenda. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mark. All right, moving on then to item number five, which is the discussion and possible awarding of the 2024 pavement marking bid. I will turn this to Mr. Bashar. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, there is an updated memo before the board this evening uh, regarding this item. Uh, so before the board this evening are the bid results for the 2024 pavement marking project. Project The bids were advertised in the March 21st and March 28th editions of the Daily Local News, and the bids were open uh, actually this morning. Uh, we received one bidder, Alpha Space Control, uh, who has done this project for numerous years. Um, and the bid amount was $212,024.45. Um, this is shared amongst a variety of municipalities, which includes West Goshen Township, East Goshen Township, West Town Township, Euclid Township, and new this year, um, in addition, are Upper Euclid Township, Westchester Borough, and West Whiteland Township. Um, as noted, it is an expanded uh, group from the 2023 bid. Um, as in the past, each, each municipality will be built based on their proportionate share of the work completed. Um, and I've outlined the last five years of expenditures for this work for the, for the board's information, with last year being $78,405. Um, in terms of the pricing, Mark did evaluate the bid results and the per unit pricing. Um, and it doesn't look like any of the prices have changed, so the inflation uh, from 2023, which is about $35,000, is due is primarily and completely due to the expanded scope uh, involving three new municipalities. So we recommend awarding the contract to Alpha Space Control based on the bid. Okay. Any questions from the board? I'm just curious. You don't usually see a decrease in 2022. It was 81,848, and in 2023, it's 78,004. I'm happy about that. I'm just curious as to. Well, it, it could be the scope is different, though, Tina. Depends what road. Yeah, yeah, the scope could be different. It's just this is for the pavement markings on the roads we're doing this year, right? Um, no, the paint pricing actually went down. Oh, oh did it? Okay. I talked out by after we opened it on the night. My question is that I thought, yeah. I thought the prices were a little bit lower. You said for negotiation with the paint company, they got lower prices, and prices have stayed line. Great. That's good. So I know we're approving the whole amount on behalf of all the participating municipalities, but what's our specific share on this? So it depends on the linear footage of the amount that's done, and that's why I outlined the last five years. So ours last year was 78,405 based on the linear footage that was done. So based on the research marks done, I would venture to guess it'll probably be around the same price. I know you, I think you, I think you budgeted about 75. Yeah. So there's a number there you have in your memo from 2019 to 20. Those are the West Coast Township. Correct. No. That is what we, that is, okay. and that's been verified in our financial software. So that is what we spent those years. The question, why, why do one bidders decide to outcome? Do we only have one bidder for this? We had a second bidder last year and they chose not to bid this year. This is a unique line of work and I can say I use Alpha Space Control in Malvern and they do do 
keeps them. I think they won this bid every time I've every time we've done it since I've been here. But you remember last year on McKenzie we had that problem where the the the, uh, the curbside line was too close and they had to come back and uh, move it out. Was that Alpha Space that made that mistake or was it? That was um, last year. That's good. Yeah, that was part of the team. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, then is someone willing to make a motion to award the bid to Alpha Space Control in the amount of $212,024.45? So moved. Second. Awesome. All right, thank you very much. Is there any public comment on this motion? Okay, hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 5-0. Thanks, Mark. Okay, moving on to item number six, which is the discussion and possible approval of a proposal from Carroll Engineering Corporation for the preparation and submission of Multimodal Transportation Fund Program grant application for storm sewer and pedestrian improvements on Montgomery Avenue. And again, I will turn this over to Mr. Bainshore to introduce. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before the board this evening is a proposal from Carroll Engineering Corporation to prepare and submit a multimodal transportation fund program grant application to the Department of Community and Economic Development. And this would involve improvements to Montgomery Avenue. Uh, the proposed project would involve replacement of the existing culvert with the uh, largest new storm pipe or perforated uh, box culverts that can be accommodated relative to depth. Um, Chris Peterson from Carroll Engineering anticipates that two or more culverts may be necessary to address flow capacity. In addition to the culvert uh, improvements, the application would propose a sidewalk extension along Montgomery Avenue southeast to connect to the asphalt driveway of the existing Parkway Cleaners property. Um, for background information for the board, uh, representatives from the township did meet with Westchester Borough um, on March 28th to discuss this proposed project and they are supportive of the application. Uh, the proposal is a not to exceed fee of, of $6,000. I did review this fee and it is comparable to the cost that the township paid for the PA Small Water and Sewer Grant application that was submitted uh, in 2022, which that amount was $5,000. Um, I did speak with Chris about the difference in price and he said one of the issues, one of the major issues in why there's a difference in price was we were able to use a lot of the information that was done through their regional study for that previous grant application for North Hill. So there's a little bit more design work that's going to be involved in this application. Um, and there's also a $100 filing fee that would be paid to IDCD for the submission of the application. Mm -hmm. So this would be to address the flooding issue and the images here that, um, that Brian has put on, the, put on the screen for everybody. Which I think all of us understand is a major issue yep. um, and has been for quite some time. So does the board have any questions uh, about this proposal? I have a question. The, I guess the size and addition of culvert um, was due to the poor condition and the ups and downs, and also it's soon to be undersized based on the regular flooding observed. And um, the township has raised this issue with PennDOT. However, they failed to address this issue in a timely fashion. Can't we continue to go after them, whether it's after we get the grant or even now? I mean, it seems like PennDOT had a big play in this. It is a pen, it's a PennDOT road, and PennDOT's going to have to be what did they say, like a co permittee or a um, like a co permittee on whatever we do. And we did discuss going after PennDOT to clean out the pipe, but the pipe is impacted. And I believe, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the past communications were pretty much like township if you want to do it you can go and do it and we would then take ownership of anything that happens and we don't want to do that yeah the pipe really doesn't work because there's so much debris right yes right. right. so we called PennDOT we mailed PennDOT we met PennDOT out there and PennDOT just the response is not great there's like you're welcome but I'm talking about it was undersized when it was installed. So they should have a party to that for paying for a portion of this now. I agree, um, but I just don't see that. I, I think once it's built, there's going to be little maintenance that has to be done for it. And I'm okay with the maintenance. I'm just talking about the cost. Uh, the cost right now. The maintenance, yeah, if we don't do that, that's fine. But the cost, they should have a share in this. I agree 100%. Yeah. 
And this is also completely in West Goshen Township, correct? Correct. That part of Chestnut there belongs to us probably a quarter mile. Was there any legal action we could take against PennDOT for sharing the cost? So I'm not aware of any case where uh, a party has been successful in recovering against PennDOT for some water damages like this situation. Um, Hope Springs Eternal, we can we can ask. It doesn't hurt to ask, but um, but candidly, it's it's not likely to be a successful case at that point. Um, you may get more uh, to the point earlier about requiring PennDOT to be a co-permittee. It may be more effective for the township overall to kind of pull PennDOT onto our team than to be adversarial with them because the permitting process for this is as you probably know, is, is pretty extensive. And having their cooperation with that um, may be worth more than the actual cost of the, or the value that you would be likely to get out of them in the event that you did file something against them. So I just want to bring up this, I went to uh, the PennDOT multimodal transportation from presentation of PSAS. This is exactly the kind of project that they're willing to support. Mm -hmm. So they said absolutely you apply for both of these Fund, to both of these funds. So this one that was highlighted in Chris's note is the DCED one, and then you also submit for the PennDOT program. So I can't imagine they would want to partner with us on that program as well. So I'm really hopeful that's a very competitive grant program. If we make a really good case with the documentation, the, the mess that's there, the fact that we've contacted them so many times, the whole thing, the, the undersizing, that this would be a prime candidate to give give some money towards. And that's a seventy percent, thirty percent program in addition to whatever you might get out of the DCD piece of it. So we could get a lot of funding for this project if we move ahead with these grant applications. And I've done that in the past. And that's why I think we should be doing so my question is is Chris is not or the proposal does not highlight Carol submitting also for the PENDA multimodal. Because that pro that program hasn't opened up yet. So later this year, right? Correct. Okay. So we do intend to take whatever work is done on this and then submit it straight into that grant application. That's correct. And from my past experience, those applications are relatively identical. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of the work can be duplicated. Okay. Well, I'm happy to hear that you think that this is going to be a good candidate for them. That, that's, that's what they said. That's really good to hear. So I just want to just quickly, how did the meeting with Westchester go? And Brian and Mark and I were all there, and I think it went very well. Now, they do have concerns about anything we do upstream impacting them I mean, downstream, yeah. but that would, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but they kind of, that would be their issue to address, and they recognize that. Would you agree? Yeah, they didn't really think there was going to be a problem, but we are going to open it up. There's going to be more flow. You know? yeah. It's going to be faster yeah. flow and, and more flow? The, the water would get downstream faster, but they didn't see that issue with this. They were more concerned with us doing more work up in the piece behind all the Okay. What we're doing but up there. But not this part of Montgomery. Because the water's still going through it. It's just mm -hmm. there's it over top of it. Yeah. And the water's still all going down to the breath. They were more concerned about what we're going to do. It's something being done behind Aldi to make that be more runoff up there. Yeah. And one, rec one recommendation that we discussed was making sure we have this documentation, which Mark's been really good about documenting the weather events that have occurred there so that we can submit those. We think those images are pretty powerful, just like we did with the North Hills application. Yeah. Um, and also getting um, letters from Chester County Hospital and Good Fellowship and maybe also the school district because this is a major thoroughfare to all of those entities. So that kind of answers my next question. I feel like DCED and some of these other entities like having this intergovernmental or just this cooperation. I feel like the more support that you can get, the stronger your case. So is Westchester then willing to sort of jump on with yes. a letter of support saying that this is needed? And, okay. And it's an emergency route. It's considered an emergency route, right? Yeah, the borough the, was... For the, the hospital. I don't, think be I don't know if it's considered an official like snow emergency route. I don't know if it's been signed that way. For emergency it's, vehicles to get I mean, to the hospital. I mean, it's the, it's the most direct. Yeah. I don't know if it's necessarily designated, as Brian was saying, I don't know if it's necessarily designated as an emergency route, but it is most certainly the most direct route from the from Gay Street into Chester County Which hospital. means faster response time and faster hospital. Right. So to me, that would be yeah, a definitely. critical road to get to, to, right. to designate. Right. That's why the hospital is going to be part of our application. Yeah. Yeah, because right, yeah. right now when these events occur, we got to go out and shut the road down. Yeah, that's my point. That's, that's huge. 
And so the sidewalk is going to continue then this way? Is that where the sidewalk is going to go? There's a sidewalk. Yeah. There's a sidewalk on the school property, and then we're going to continue it down right. until all the way to, to the, the parkway park where the park and driveway yep. is. So, so generally, with these applications, you have to connect multiple forms of transportation. So when we were talking about this, we have the vehicular transportation with the roadway flooding and then extending the sidewalk to provide a further pedestrian access. Now the Burroughs pipes, existing pipes that go around Chick-fil-A and all that area on the ground for the creek, will they be able to handle it? The existing infrastructure that's there? With the with greater flow, with more flow going through, because it's going to obviously go to the borough. This, this goes down through the borough. That's what you actually, mean to the borough. Can they handle all that with the extra flow? It's it, there's Again, not extra right flow. It's just the flow is going to be contained under the roads that are flowing over the top of the road. There's no, we're not releasing any more water. We're not creating any more water. We're just allowing the water to stay under the road. So okay. That's the plan: is to keep the water under the roads. So the water across. Just to be sure, so with our blocked pipes and not acting as a dam, it's impounding water up behind uh, on West Goshen side of the road that then slowly passes through. That doesn't happen from that picture. Doesn't look like it happens, but that could. The be. impoundment death might be a foot. Okay. It's not. It's so not a. Way. It's not. A, it's not a substantial right. depth. Okay. And then is that a pen? Is the sidewalk going to be maintained by pen? No, under our ordinance, the sidewalk would be maintained by the property owners. Which would be Parkway. Correct. Well, which would be, yeah, Parkway Cleaners, and I don't know who that one property owner is. Is, is that the borough? Is that borough? No. That's yeah. the, the, jur the jurisdictional boundary goes through the entrance to the Gay Street Plaza a little further to the west. Okay. And so, are they aware of the sidewalk, and do we have the ability to just put it in? Yes. You have the ability. Yeah. You have the ability to just put it in, and then they're responsible for maintaining it. We haven't had any conversations with them. The application is due July 31st, so we can have engagement with them in advance of submitting the application. Um, but no, you have the and Eric, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you have the authority to install it within the public right of way as long as PennDOT gives the okay, since, okay. since they have the right of way. Right, that's correct. So one other thing I would think would be a good idea is I know we close the road now when there's a blood drain event, but in the past we've had people get stuck in there, right? You've had to go in there and even when the road's closed. Uh, so you have, no, insert, go you, you have insert reports to document that, either Absolutely. rescue people no, from vehicles or loss yeah. of property. Yeah. You know, one car was a ride off, right? Sure, that would be really good to support the application as well. Yeah, Chief, if you have any of those reports, that'd be great. I have all those reports. <laughs> also, just Thanks, to expand Chief. the report, just remember to you have to close the road. To, to answer the question about the property, it's one property. Oh, okay, so it's all the parkway. Yes, mm -hmm. it's all it's all the cleaner property. I'm just wondering if we can get some something from you know Chaz or somebody saying the response time is critical. Okay, we we intend to reach out to Good Fellowship and Chester County Hospital and get as much information as they can as to how impactful this is to their service. You know, the, uh, the state record certainly be a little more as well. All right, so is somebody that I have two more questions, sorry, actually. All right. So, um, Mark, you're comfortable that ultimately we're going to own the maintenance of this improvement, right? Because that's the way it's written in Carol's note. The maintenance of these facilities be the future responsibility of the township as part of the HOP. So that means cleaning out the inlet, taking care of the I think it would be in the best interest that we make. You're, you're okay with that? Okay. Yes, we would. All right. So my second question is, um, so in, we need to understand what our cost might be in applying for this grant, not just the grant application, but if the project is approved and we get these grants, what will be our contribution amount? So uh, I talked briefly with Chris Peterson about the overall construction cost for this and he didn't have a definitive number obviously at this point but he indicated he thought it'd be similar to Baltimore Street so kind of a eight hundred to thousand to a million dollar project. Would you agree Mark? Yeah. So if we get I don't know what the D C D grant would be, if we get the Pen dot grant, we're looking at the seventy thirty, so our out of pocket hit could be in the three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar range, ignoring the D C D <coughs> contribution. So I just want the people to be aware that that's what we may have to fund ultimately. That's pretty good considering we thought it was going to be three million dollars. And now we're back to small amounts, so that's pretty good. But this says it, it, it awards funding between 100000 and $3 million for projects. 
so we don't really know how much they're going to. We don't. Maybe they can look at our project say, you know, hundred thousand if we get it. No. They may give us half the project cost, not seventy percent of it. Yeah, and ours is thirty percent match. But you know, almost uh, to me, it's like it'll probably be half a million dollars, maybe. I think this is such an issue and such a drain on our resources, not to make a pun, I guess, um, that it would be worth that cost, Absolutely. even if we were to get that. But this has just been a long time coming, and yes. it just needs to be fixed. And we certainly have, we're very, we have a healthy balance in our general fund, which yeah. can be appropriately moved to capital reserve when, if and when we get the ground. Why am I sitting on this money? This is what we should be spending. Yeah. Yeah. This will really improve a, a lot of people's lives and help out with Emergency oh, services. Oh, yeah. And to, to the maintenance question about the township taking on the maintenance, I have much more faith in Mark and his crew to maintain this when it's done than that done. Great. Yeah. Yeah. We, we know where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> we can catch up with him. When you're saying that you don't foresee that it's going to require a whole lot of maintenance? No, we'll stay on top of it. Um, but the way the culvert's going to be built yeah. is going to flow. Any debris gets in there, we can go in there and get it out. Right now, we're afraid to touch it because there's gating baskets up there. If we go in there and touch it, I'm afraid we're going to own it. So, I think it's pretty fragile. I think PEMDOT's basically told us if we go in and touch it, we're going to own whatever we destroy. Right, so that's why we don't want to touch it. Okay. Is the culvert going to be about the same size as the Bomar Street? I think it probably. It won't, it won't be able to be the same size as a bar if you don't have the, the vertical clearance. Right. It's going to be, have to be a, a, a lower, narrow, wider column, okay. not the vertical clearance. The full bar has the vertical clearance, yeah, not the yeah, width. This has the width and not the vertical not clearance. The height, yeah. So okay. it's a cut, it'll be custom design. Mm -hmm. Chris will have to do the design and the hydraulic calculations to figure out what can fit there and how to, and how to pass it through. Right. Like, we don't want to lift the road up. No. Because you're changing the grading at that point. So the, all that, that's why there's a little bit more money in this proposal because there's a, a, he has to do investigation and some engineering calculations and work to figure out what size can go in there and how to do it without impacting the other surrounding areas. And then from there, he can create his estimate for the cost, which is because of the bid. I guess I mean, the, they're into the, sorry, not the bid, but into the package that gets submitted for the grant of how much you think it's going to cost. Part of his work is to come up with a construction cost for once he comes up with it. Conceptual design. Okay. Right. I guess because it's smaller diameter, is there going to be any filters or traps or anything that's going to have to be put in there versus the one on Walmart's is so large you don't want to need them? No, no filters or traps, you want free flow. Yeah, you don't want anything yeah. in the next I'm just saying the debris or anything. I, you, you, I mean, it's up to Chris, but I think Chris and Mark need to talk with Brian around. You need a little bit of an upstream catch for big That's logs what I'm and stuff. Yeah. You don't want to have the big logs. I mean, if you have those big logs coming out, it's just Yeah, no, that's my point. But, but, so, but you're talking about filtering, not filtering the water. It's not a filtering, no, not filtering the, the water, filtering the debris. Yeah, there'll be something in place to protect yeah. the call yeah. and keep them clogged. Okay. But there's only so much you can do. Right. No, I agree. But when we did the CDC cleanup, there was a lot of stuff in that creek. That, yeah. A lot of yes. filtered trails. So okay. that, that will be considered in the detailed design, but it may be considered in the design for the level of detail you need for the grant application. Mm -hmm. So there's so much you need to do now, and you're going to do all the, the details. The detail work yeah. at that point. Okay. Okay. All right. So, Madam Chair, I just wanted to mention, yes. uh, as juxtaposed to the prior item, these terms have been reviewed by our office and negotiated closely with Carol. So these terms are acceptable and ready to be approved uh, whenever the board would care to. Very good. And yeah, Chris has told me that what was previously approved as general in terms by Kristen and her office is what he's incorporating in all our proposals. Good. Great. Moving forward, that's good. Okay, so then is somebody willing to make a motion? I will make that motion to approve, accept the proposal for grant application for improvements on Montgomery Avenue. Okay, and then John's a second. All right, thank you. Is there any comment on this motion? Yes, Mr. I totally agree with everything you guys are saying. I go through there three or four times a day. And when it's flooded, it is dangerous. Yeah. Um, and adding a sidewalk is a huge uptick in this because students walk there every day back and forth to all the fast food places. Plus, when there's out of town sports, all those folks walk down through that sidewalk and they're walking across 
as you know. Um, I have a nickname for it, it's called Lake Montgomery because there's so much flux. There's usually a car flowing in I've got several of those pictures. Um, so I think this is really township money for this. Now people won't have to make such a hard decision about whether they drive through the it's lake or not. Hard. It's not <laughs> really that difficult for the fish to them. Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah, and hopefully sure that thing. problem is mitigated. Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, sorry. I have a quick question. Uh, will the road have to be resurfaced there when we do that project? Uh, I'm assuming it will. I don't know, Brian. Yes, the road will have to be rebuilt. The whole road will be removed and then the culvert, whatever. whatever a culvert is a generic term for passing water under a road. Yeah. So the culvert, whatever it is, it may not be a pipe, it may be what's called a box culvert, or it's actually a rectangle. It may be a, a, a cell style with multiple cells, or maybe a, a custom designed, custom port piece, <coughs> custom cast piece for it to let the water come through. But yes, that goes in, the road's rebuilt on top of it. And it flows into the goose, is that correct? This is the goose. This, this is, is the goose, yeah. okay. Right. Good. Well, I, all I can say is my wife won't yell at me when I go to Jane Lattice, the vet there, and uh, the water's there because we were just recently there, and I drove through it, and I got an earful. I'm sure you did. And it wasn't water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, any other comments, questions? No? Okay. Then all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries five to zero. All right. So moving on to item number seven, the discussion and possible authorization to advertise a proposed amendment to chapter seven, township manager of the West Goshen Township Code of Ordinances. So I mentioned a few meetings ago um, that, and we adopted an employment agreement with our township manager. Um, and so this would be an amendment to the code. Um, amending section 7-5 so that any severance is pursuant to an employment agreement approved by the board. Does the board, so the board I'm sure had a chance to read through this ordinance. Do you have any questions or comments? No, I, I have a question. Um, I, I agree with, you know, with the uh, consider tonight, but also I'm just asking, do we also need to consider uh, amending chapter 7-2 Code, which um, has to do with the term of appointment. <clears throat> Specifically, it says currently that the township manager shall be appointed for an indefinite term by a majority of all members of the Board of Supervisors and shall serve at the pleasure, at the pleasure of the Board of Supervisors and shall be subject to removal by the Supervisors by majority vote. Um, in our last meeting, we uh, adopted the township manager agreement which gave us a specific timeline on when that term would be. Should we have a reference in, or change the verbiage in 7-2 to reflect that? So I guess I would have kicked that over to the board, so let's go and see So I would want to look at it more carefully, um, but I think that the, that the language that you've described there, because okay, the way I would interpret it is this. When you have a manager, what they don't want you to do, based on the language of that terminology, is appoint them for six months at a time, right? So that you have a constant sort of, in other words, the indefinite term is there to protect the relationship of the manager to the township, not to necessarily protect the township. Um, so to that extent, I would say that you could probably proceed without modifying it. But what I would want to see is, I would want to make sure that how that works with this provision, such that if you're going to have now a severance agreement, and you've got uh, another provision that says that you have an indefinite term, what, what, what controls, in other words? Um, so that it's a fair question that, uh, let me look at it a little bit more closely after this meeting. Um, I would say that to the extent that you're going to consider advertising, if you're, you're uncertain at this point, you hold that back until we have that conversation about modifying section two as well, because adding that to this would necessitate re-advertisement. I wouldn't want to see the township. Yeah. I mean, my, my understanding of it was that the the um, the previous the, the the manager's agreement is what's defined by the term of the manager's agreement. That's what expires and has to be reauthorized, not the to, not the section seven two. That's I think they are independent. Yeah, that's what I think. Oh, so maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Yeah. yeah. 
the, the employment agreement is not about uh, the length of, of, of the term of office, it's to do with the length of term of the agreement, but it needs to be modified after two years right, or right. changed or expired. It just it doesn't affect the. And leave 72. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. No, that, 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 that does, does make more sense. Yeah, that's, 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 that's that was our interpretation too. Yeah. Yeah. As you're saying it, that does make much more sense. Yeah. yeah. So, given that, and John, I, I'm not saying that we don't have to look at 7 2, but maybe, I mean, I. Do you think it's safe to proceed Tell you forward? what, why don't we do it this way? Authorize this to proceed. If necessary, we'll do a separate ordinance and we can merge them at the time of the enactment. You can just be, you would have to advertise that separate ordinance separately, to be clear. If you're going to also modify 7.2, that would be a separate advertisement. But, um, but well, we would decide know. at that point. If we don't know the answer and there is really no rush in passing this, is it just worth getting that answer before and doing it at the next meeting? Well, I actually had one thing too that I want clarification on. So, okay, so you, Gina, you, have a, that's, you have a different issue with the ordinance. Yes, I do. What is your issue? Um, again, I totally agree with it. It's, it's great to have it. Um, but I'm just wondering if we want to have consistent language with the ordinance that we're, we have in the agreement. Being said, in the sentence it starts with, in the event of the dismissal, and I added, not due to firing or poor performance or resignation of the manager at will, at the request of the supervisor, the manager shall be entitled to severance pay for so to an amount. Because we do talk about at will in the agreement versus not at will. So yes, as a general matter, it is, it is sensible to include a provision that says that you won't play, pay severance in the event of a dismissal for cause. Right. That, that is a sensible provision to include. Um, that's, just real quick, that's in the contract That's in the contract terms, and the contract terms state that the terms of the contract supersede any ordinance or policy or anything like that. So that, that's fine, and that, that's good for the relationship that you have with the, the township now. Okay. As far as codifying it for the future, um, Future manager, would probably, they seem to want the future manager to get the same deal. So, um, so that would be the. Well, the agreement could change in the future, like the contract language could change in the future with a different manager. Exactly. That, that they would negotiate to, then. To make them, them consistent, that yes, that would so be. So that, that should be in there, that language. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, who wants it? Or did you get that? I got it. Okay. Yeah, Ari's going to include that. Um, so again, given Tina's suggestion and our question about 7-2, how does the board want to proceed? Let me table it till the next meeting. Yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. We're just getting things up here, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Are you okay with that, Chris? It's at the discretion of the board. <laughs> Fine. Yeah. Okay. I knew you were going to say that, but... So we will table this uh, for our next meeting. All right, and we're going to move on to item number eight, which is the discussion and possible authorization to advertise a proposed amendment to Chapter 57, Park and Recreation Areas of the West Goshen Township Code of Ordinances. And this amendment really has to do with police or other entities being required by the number of people attending park events. Um, so, the proposed amendment would require that any event with a stated attendance of 500 or more people would be required to have security from the West Ocean Township Police Department at the cost of the sponsor of the event. And it says the proposed amendment specifies the traffic safety unit shall determine the number of officers deemed necessary for the event. Um, and so, I know I have a couple questions. Does the board have any questions about this ordinance? Um, yeah, but yes. you kick it off, yeah. All right, well, I mean, my, my first question is the 500 number, and I'm not sure where that came from. Did that come from the Parks and Rec Committee discussion? It came from the police. Is that yeah. correct, Chief? The, the 500 number of police presence is going to be required at a... I don't know where it came from. I can find out. Okay. I, believe, I, believe, well, I believe it came from Sergeant Eraser, and I also... Yeah. In speaking with uh, our park and recreation director, Ken Lear, he's generally used as a rule of thumb, five, 500 is like a number where police presence would So be if there were an event that had 400 people, which is, I think, the number of people we had last year uh, for the holy event that we're expecting. Mm -hmm. um, and we had police last year, I think, directing traffic. Is that right? I don't recall. I know that there were, so there were a lot of people last year. 
Um, I'm just wondering if the 500 is too high. I have the same question because I thought yeah. when you apply for a permit, isn't there an indication of the expected number of attendees on the permit application? Yes, that's uh, correct. What, what are the numbers on the permit application? Is it 400? Well, you indicate the number of okay, it's anticipated not, it's not a range, attendees. It's not like a range. Is it, you know, the, the there's a different yeah. fee structure, but there's you indicate the number of people that are going to be on your application. Okay. And one of the things that has occurred recently with some of them is a permit will be issued for a set number of people, and then we will get contacted that that's going to exceed that set number. And one thing that can also compound this issue is we have, a, like for example, a community park, we have existing lease agreements with the baseball leagues to utilize the facilities at community park. So you could you have the potential for a convergence of a variety of, of a number of people. So if you have a large event, you also have the baseball leagues who, if it's a nice day, will be there from morning until the evening. So that's one of the other issues to take into consideration. Okay. In answer to your question, where the 500 came from, I guess you have to set a limit somehow, somewhere, you know, so. I know, I understand that, but based on at least my experience and, and knowing that last year with this specific event that I referenced, having about 400, um, I felt that that number of people would require at least one officer present to direct traffic or to respond if anything happened. So I'm actually, I actually think 500 is too high. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. So you think it should be lower? Yeah, it's 400. 400. What do you think? Honestly, initially when Ken and I talked about this, he was kind of going off the direction of the Park and Recreation Board, but when Ken and I talked about this, we threw out 250. Yeah, kind of like, what's your take on that, Mike? Off the top of my head, I would be afraid to give you a number we're talking about. Okay, so we should yeah. confirm that with the police too. We really but, should. But Mike, not to put you on the, not to put you on the spot, but if you have the <laughs> but, if you're looking, but if you're looking at an event with 250 people compounded with the lease agreements that we have, like for the baseball leagues, I mean, they That's can draw a lot of people. Well, right now. And my other question is how many people sh can show up to these baseball events? I mean, if they have 200 people, I don't want them to have to require an officer, or maybe well, they will. I, right, because then that'll be on the, the league to then. Well, they're subject to a separate lease agreement outside of the permitting process or the provisions of the... So it would not be subject to what's here? No. no they're subject to the provisions of their lease. Okay, so this is really just for people any renting. How many, how, organization. how many events do we have a year that would be, say, 250 or more? Uh, Ken does a report, I would say. I think he told me today we have like three or four. So we're not talking about a large number of events, but like where we get the need, for the real need for police presence at some of these events are there's... um. There are charitable organizations that draw a large crowd. One big one is the uh, 5K run that I believe the SPCA does that's coming up in a couple of weeks. That's the Which that's 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 work because they go on the streets. Exactly. What about the Easter egg? Uh, the Easter, well, the Easter egg hunt is separate because that's a township sponsored event. And the police do work those events. I think we have three officers at the one this year. And when we Philly Magic plays, we have 750 people. Cars are. What are the big concerns you wanted at the park? How many cars are going to show up? Yeah, so. Are the five are the five Ks and the other runs are those sponsored events? They're usually private, so they pay for it. So they do pay for it. Okay. SPCA is an exception. So I think at least I think two fifty it would be good. Yeah. Just for at least one officer, and then if they file for a permit that says we think it might be more, then I don't know how we could work that out with additional officers. Quick but. question, uh, and perhaps this came up at Parks and Rec, but was it discussed to perhaps invert? The, that maximum, in other words, say, here, here's your permit application, certify that there won't be more than 250 people present, um, and have some mechanism of penalty, or you don't get any park permits anymore. If yeah, we did discuss that. that. Yeah. yeah, actually, maybe holding security deposits, and I wanted to increase sure. the security deposit, I asked for a credit card, you know, all, all kinds of things. Okay. So, yeah. We do currently take a secure, it's a hundred dollar security deposit for use of the pavilion and there's a various provisions that would revolve, that would result in keeping that security deposits. And one of those provisions are attendance in excess of the amount listed on the permit. Yeah, well that's a whole other thing. We yeah, look at the price. 
said, but Ken's actually doing, Ken and the Park and Recreation Board are actually doing an analysis of our fee structure, and I believe they formed a small committee to kind of analyze those fees. Yes. How does any of this enforce? So let's say I come and say, I'm playing an event, I think I'm going to get about 200 people, I fill out the permit application, it doesn't hit the threshold, and then I sell tickets, and suddenly I've got a really popular event, and I'm now expecting 500 people, I don't tell anyone, I just sell 500 tickets, and the day comes, and who, 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 you know, that question was raised at the Parks and Rec Board as well, Doreen. So I think we would rely, because the police do patrol, and Ken notifies the police of every picnic permit or any pavilion rental that comes up, he does send information. They don't count people. No, they don't count people. <laughs> but my point is, I think from their experience, I believe the police would be a good judge, of, would have a good idea of something that's getting out of hand, so to speak. I'm just saying like... Well, out of hand, yes, but... Yeah, what's it just a boisterous 600 people event? They all leave, there's trash everywhere, and boy, you guys hundred dollars security deposit. Well, that's oh, a, that's another. I talked about to, upping that too. That's another thing where we can keep their security deposit. If they leave it like a wreck, then that's another provision where we can keep their security. But hundred dollars is not. Yeah, I, think I don't know. How, I don't know how you would enforce any kind of a maximum other than just general understanding of crowd size, which again is subjective. But I do think our police are competent and can figure that. Well, maybe one suggestion is at least if you if you're applying for a permit for more than 250 people, your security deposit is high. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it needs to be 250. And there's a and there's also there's also so many, only so many parking spaces in the in the case of the um, holy event that's upcoming. They did secure an agreement for additional parking at another facility on Lawrence Drive. Yeah, they did that themselves. So then, have we discussed a maximum amount of people that are allowed at any given event, private event? Are you talking? To, are you talking? So you're talking about a like, maximum, not like shall a not exceed this event shall not exceed X number of people. I think that might go back to Ari's comment about having them certify the maximum number of people. Yeah. Now, and what, if you're going to do that, then you have to have it for each park. You can't have 500 people at Barker Park. You almost have to go to each park and say, this is the amount you cannot exceed. If we're going to do that. And, the, and again, I think the, the ad hoc committee, mark. and the ad hoc committee, I think, is going to look at that as well. That was just formed yeah. the Parks and Rec. Um, You're saying 500, that, that's, or two, even 250 is going to be a lot for Barker Park. What they mean with the crowding and then parking, and it's almost like you have to look at each park separately and put a max associated with it. Somebody could decide to have something in Paley Park that has no parking and have 200 people come. So I, I think this, you can't have a generic number here that fits all parks in West Goshen. And then we're looking at Greystone, you know, eventually you're going to have people there that are going to want to let the pavilion. This is the mechanism you talked about hiring the police. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I can't imagine Paley Pike requiring a party of Paley Pike requiring that big, so small. Right, and we don't anticipate that we're going to have a huge gathering at something like Barker Park that would be at like the extent that we're expecting with this holy celebration at the community park. Um, I understand what you're saying, Tina, at, but, but Mike's right in the sense that this is addressing the police issue. And so the number that I think, and I agree with Chris and Ken that they came up with is that if you have 250 people coming to an event at any park, that there should be at least one officer there to direct traffic and make sure that, that things are... We don't have any input from Sergeant Greaser on this, right? I mean, we've changed the number tonight to Harvard, and now it's like we're going to tell them, we're going to ask, hey, is 275 people coming to eat one or two? Hey, it's a 350 person event. Is it, I mean, should we just have a basic I actually did have the conversation with Sergeant Russell okay. at the West Coast Township uh, Traffic Committee meeting just last week. And I asked him that specific question, and he still applied for it would be appropriate number. I know, but again, last year we had the Holy Celebration, and it was 400, and there was a police presence there, and it was needed. There were enough people there that I think that. I'm just right. you, I'm just, you know, related to what you said. Yeah, no, and I'm not saying that Sergeant Grazer doesn't, you know, obviously he's way more versed in this than I am. It's just I know from at least last year what I saw, and there were police present, and there were 
security pipe, and there should be. Um, I had one another comment too. Um, under section one, um, after the it says 500 or more people, which obviously we're going to possibly change. It says police security shall be required, and I added a whole another thing in there that says if the police deem fit per the safety of the community, depending on the type of event, the police at their discretion may require police presence below whatever we say, 500, 250 people, but the sponsor will be notified in advance, is what I said. And I've also added the next sentence, the sponsor shall be responsible for the, I said, full cost of police security, because it doesn't say how much they're responsible for. So I've added those two sections. So Tina, just going back to your first statement, so you're saying the police could look at an event and say, hey, it's only 150 people, but I think we need police there. Yeah, depending on the type of event, I think you should leave it open to the Would discretion you? of the police and not lock it in so that oh, yeah. you have another way out in the event that's needed. That's how, that's how it currently is now. Currently, the language that reads is police presence is at the discretion of the township. There's no number, there's no cap. Right now, the way it's written into the code is it's as complete discretion of the township. The only problem with that is if I like that, except for if they want to know what the cost is, they need to know up front. This, this what they're they do it. They do know up front. There's a whole detail yeah. sheet that they need to fill out and submit and complete to the police department and list the cost on it. But if you're signing a contract and you don't know how much police, whether the police are going to be there or not, you don't know the full cost. The permit's not approved until Ken and Brian talk and he tells them what he thinks they need. Oh, and he tells, gets back to what so, he needs and the cost. So currently, okay. currently it's an hourly rate. I believe it's 140 an hour, something like that. I would argue with you, but I don't know. I think it's around 140 an hour. So if if two officers, 280 times a four or five hour event. So you can figure you can figure it out because on the form they fill out how many hours they're going to need for how many hours the event is going to be. Okay. So and again, Ken Ken and Sergeant Greiser determine that, and then Ken communicates that to the permit. Okay. So I'm, I'm totally confused as to why we're even doing this. Then. Yeah. If you already have a process in place that allows the police to look at every permit application, to determine whether security is needed, why are we talking about caps and numbers? The issue is there's nothing in, the issue that was raised about this was there's nothing in our code that specifies when something kicks in, and the whole goal was to make it clear as to if you hit this number, you're going to need police presence. Can't we just have a code that refers to permit process and the discretion of police and we why do we that's, have to try to clarify specific numbers? That's currently how it is. want to change it two well, years from now we're re advertising and change to the code. Is see why we're doing it there? So the, there's a difference so I and I've been trying to kind of get my head around the difference between this ordinance and like the permit or the contract and what they see when they apply for a permit and the number of people. So like for example they're not going to go through our code to look to see if they can do something. If someone wants to have a party or a big event that's gonna have 350 people, they're not gonna go into the West Ocean Township code and go through it and say, so we need to have a permit application that clearly lists the rules and expectations and it's a contract that they're going to enter into. So as it says now, I guess, does it say on the contract at the discretion of the police that, that they may need? It doesn't say anything on the permit, I don't believe it says anything on the permit, I could be wrong, but it does, it makes reference to the provisions in our code of ordinances, and then that's where it would trigger, you know, the need for police presence. Right, and so I think when people get caught off guard, which is what recently happened with an event, not understanding and not realizing that they were going to need to absorb the cost of, of police, um, that we it would be good to have it in our code legally so that they can come back to that and, and we can reference what's in the code, but then to also on the permit application make that just very clear that if you exceed this number of people, you're going to require at least one officer. Or well, you're going to require police presence. And they're going to be required to pay the full cost. That's all we need to say. So, Sean. So, I would like to make it very simple in the code that this is basically, you know, we code will let them authorize this us to charge for police presence and that is determined through the permit process. Determined through the permit yeah, process. Not, yeah, not specifying numbers or anything right. else. Right, I agree. Okay. Now that we have a better understanding. I mean, do you agree that that's something that might work, Aaron? Uh, it, it could if you give them some rubric with which to evaluate it. So for example, 
um, you might want to include something along the lines of, um, if you're not going to have a, a specific number, you would say taking into account things like the size of the park where the, the event is to be located, the projected number of attendees, the, the season, the the likely traffic conditions in the vicinity of the, the, in other words, what you don't want to do is you don't want to create a situation where a, a permittee could come back and say that the police department was kind of arbitrary in the way they approached this and they assigned the entire police force to pick up another couple of hours because they don't like that one applicant or they don't like what they have to say or they don't like who they are. That's what you're trying to avoid. So you want to create some objective mechanism for the police to use. It could be that it could be as simple as a number of people. You know, any application to use a park with a number larger than fifty might require police presence unless the police deem that it's not necessary. That kind of thing. So that you're putting, you're giving the police the option to say, no, we, we don't have to be there. But that's you're giving them the option to say, no, we do have to be there for everything that's in excess of a certain number. In other words, give them some objective basis to both base the decision to be there and the assignment. Of the appropriate resources, give them something to base that decision on. And that's what's handed to the applicant. So that would go on the code. What would go on the, the application form might be some condensed version of that, like um, any event in excess of the X number of people, or, or any the, the necessity for police presence will be determined based on the following factors. It would have like a little bullet point list. Um, you know, to the point earlier, some of the parks are larger than others. Maybe maybe 100 people is too many at one park, where 500 might be appropriate in another park. That, that, those are things that the police department can do. What I would encourage you to do is document how you're making those decisions, right? And you know, establish some sort of just easy, quick reference sheet. It says if you're going to do an event at uh, Park X, you're going to have X number of people have this many police officers as a default, right? And it's always subject to negotiation and discussion with the, the applicant mm -hmm. and special circumstances and those sorts of things. But by giving them some objective criteria, you're providing an awful lot of cover um, in the event that there is a dispute in the future with an applicant. Okay. So given that. So what I would say is either pick a number or let's work up a list. Um, so, you know, it, and I would say pick a number <coughs> below which you're comfortable saying that no gathering requires police presence. And then anything above that, there will be police presence subject to the discretion of the police department right. and based on these criteria. Okay. Board? I, I think the section one needs a enough of a rewrite to accommodate that approach that I think if we do it, it might get to the satisfaction myself at least. I agree. I agree. So we can get some input from the this too. Sure. And also some Yeah, right. Back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board. Okay. Very good. Progress. We will table that uh, potentially at our next meeting. But if it needs some work, we'll see when we can get that on the agenda next. Okay. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you. Um, okay. And Ari, I think that might be it for you tonight. I don't know that we need you anymore. It is. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks for being here. Have a good night. Okay, so moving on then to item number nine, which is the discussion and possible approval discussion and possible approval of resolution number 13-2024, authorizing the submission of a Greenways Trails and Recreation Program grant application for certain improvements to West Goshen Community Park. So this would be a grant application to the Commonwealth Financing Authority seeking 250000 in funding for improvements to the community park, which would include the splash pad and the expansion of the bathroom to build a family bathroom. Okay. So this is the third of the three grant programs we were looking at. We've been successful in two of them. Um, the cap for this is $250,000. Uh, there is a 15% match requirement, um, but we would utilize the existing uh, money that we have received from other agencies to go towards our match component. Um, so this is a $1.2 million project, all told. Um, and so if successful, we would, have, we would be able to secure $700,000 towards that cost. 
And when you say one point two million dollars, that includes the that that's correct. everything. That is the whole thing. But this would not go toward obviously the basketball courts or anything like that. Uh, no, Madam Chair, just because I anticipate that those will be completed before this, this is even announced. But we'll utilize, we'll seek reimbursement through the other programs that we have. In fact, um, Ken and I were just talking today about the um, bidding schedule for the basketball courts and the tennis court improvements that Chris Peterson outlined. So those will probably go out to bid soon. Um, our plan is to hold off on doing those until after the summer camp program because we don't want the basketball courts not to be accessible during summer camp at Community Park. Okay, so that would be done in September? Yeah, probably September time frame. Something like that, okay. Right. The application would be done in-house? Correct. Um, I believe we can utilize a lot of what we used for the um, other two programs for this application. Excellent. Any questions from the board? So we're willing to make a motion then to authorize the submission of the Greenways Trails and Recreation Program grant application. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Is there any question or comment on this motion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, hearing none, motion passes five to zero. Item number 10 is the discussion and possible approval of resolution number 14-2024, authorizing the destruction of certain records of the West Goshen Township Police Department. We have a list here. I think has been provided to the public, has it? Yes. Okay. Of the documents that are listed to be destroyed. Are there any questions from the board or comments? I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, there's a citation ID PW-6-2017. It just says Ford Sedan. What, what, is, what is that about? That's the paperwork for the maintenance of the car that we don't have to that's all they're just making this right for. And then there's also one 2010, 2021, so it's an 11-year period of right for us, not right to no requests. Just what they want, whether we should be keeping more than just the last three years on right to no requests. That, oh, I'm sorry. That, that's pursuant to the record keeping uh, guidance from the Pens uh, Pennsylvania Municipal Records Manual. So obviously the three years is the minimum, is the minimum you need to keep, but we've we, been keeping 14 years of records today, right? So, and th these are paper records we're talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We still maintain electronic copies. Okay. Okay. Can I have a question on um, PO24, the training records? I'm assuming that it's only for the expired training records? These are all based on what the state requires us, how long the state requires us to keep them. Everyone's personnel jacket that has training certificates, if they remain. Okay. So if they got trained and it never expires, that would, that would still remain. Right. Okay. So we do a little bit of catch up here because those records, some of them 1989, so this is about a little house clear. A lot of catch up, yes. Okay. All right. How long does the law require that? Paper records be maintained. Does it depend on the type of record it is? Depends on what kind of record. So it's going to yeah. But like you said, there's going to be an electronic copy kept of these anyway. Yes. Because so there is some legislation that's floating around Harrisburg right now to try to minimize frivolous right to know requests. And having a history of going back over a period of time might be helpful you know, in trying to uh, deal with that. So as long as there's some way to retrieve the information I want, we should be. All right, so then does somebody want to make the motion to accept uh, resolution number 14-2024? I'll make that motion. I'll second. All right, thank you. Is there any public comment or questions? Yes, Dr. White. Uh, any accident reports on there? Accident reports. 2014. Yes, but not fatal accident. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, hearing none, motion carries five to zero. Item number 11 is the discussion and possible authorization to solicit bids for certain property of West Goshen Township. Mr. Bachelor? 
Uh, Madam Chair, before the board this evening is consideration to authorize the sale of certain property owned by West Goshen Township. In the past, these sales have been primarily centered on surplus vehicles. However, in speaking with members of our streets department, we're trying to make a lot of space in our parks department. There are a lot of items that have just been kind of sitting around that we're looking to get rid of to free up some space. Um, I provided a list, um, a list to the board for review, um, as well as an estimated value for those uh, for those items. Uh, certain items would be grouped as a single pallet to be sold. So essentially, whoever wanted one item has to buy everything. And John marked those off as so what would be sold as a pallet. Um, if authorized for sale, the items outlined in the attached list uh, will be placed on Municipid as we've done with recent sales in the past and the winning bidders will be brought back to the board uh, for approval once the bidding closes. So just to kind of go over some of the items that are listed on here, it includes uh, one, two, three, four, five vehicles which have been replaced with new vehicles so they're ready to be sold, um, as well as some equipment such as a um, just a walk behind concrete saw, a jet cold saw, um, snow blowers, leaf, uh, leaf machines, things of that nature, um, as well as a hardwood dance floor that none of us could figure out how to value. <laughs> well, what did you ever use it for? Uh, you it, or something? For selling the dance floor? Yes. yes. It hasn't been used. No so when I saw it, when I when John put this list, oh, and also chairs and monitors that we have from the administration department that have just been sitting around. Um, when John put this list together for me and sent it, I called him and I said, we have a dance floor and I have heard that it hasn't been used in t over 20 years um, and it's just sitting around collecting dust. Apparently there used to be a square dancing group that used to utilize it um, at some of our events. Um, so. We don't know how to value it. We couldn't find anything comparable when we researched it, so we figured we would start it at around $100 and see what happens. Hmm. Square dancing group. Yeah. All right. And, uh, any questions from the board on this list? Yeah, Chris, on the admin department, chairs and monitors, are they on a pallet or do they know if you have individual chairs? Or no, no, it would be a whole group of them. A whole group, <laughs> single, single group of them. Correct. Okay. So how they're, how they're listed with each, with each item is how they'd be sold. So group of chairs, group of monitors, things of that nature. So we're just doing some housekeeping of this. Correct. But how often is this done? I mean, is this looks like, like the dance floor, you know, that must look like that's been around for a while. I mean, how often do we do this? As far as I know, this is the first time we've done something like this. John, so John came to me in the fall, like some earlier this year or maybe late last year, and asked me about you know getting rid of some equipment that's just kind of sitting around. We talked about the process. He asked me if we could sell things as like a pallet. I told him I thought that would be perfectly fine. So he put together he put together a list of things that he thought we could get rid of, and it's fairly extensive. Cool. Okay. What you did is you come pick it up, right? Correct. Everything. Everything would be they have to come pick it up. We've had people come from New Jersey, Maryland, West Virginia. All right, so then does so somebody want to make the motion to authorize the sale of this property? I'll make that motion. All right, thanks. Is there a second? I'll second. Good. Okay, very good. Name. Any public comment? Yes, Dr. White? This is available to the public. Yes. Okay. Uh, may you please describe how the public can participate? So, how they can work. Everything is we legally advertise when they go to bid. We time it with municipal bid. The municipal bid is a public website and they can go on and they can search for West Goshen and they can come up with whatever we have listed for sale. So it's just called Municipid website. Mm -hmm. you, yep. you, you Google Municipid, it should be the first thing that comes up. And we've been using this since 2022 pretty successfully. So if we include this tonight, when would it be up on the Municipid website? Sometime next week. Okay. Do you want to put anything on our own web page that we have items for sale directly for the Municipid? Is it worth doing that? I don't really think so, given how much traffic we get on it. We get some of these vehicles, I provided the bidding reports, and we get 50, 60 bids. One of our vehicles, we got over 10,000 views on it. Yeah. So we can, it's. I was thinking, what, for given the extent of this list, is a little different than all, you know, big heavy equipment list that we typically sold previously. So when you've got these smaller items that might be of interest to residents, 
Like someone be on my own to dance floor? Yeah, yeah. Just notifying, I'm putting just a notice of message on the what I think might be better is maybe using the social media as opposed to the what is, what website. Whatever we can do to notify people. Yeah, we can talk to Dandelion. Yeah. Right, and we'll put it out on social media. Okay. Right. Uh, so then, I put the links in the um, in the legal ad to, to the items that are for sale. So this is going to be a pretty extensive legal ad. So I can send them the links that we need to submit creates, and we can utilize those. Thanks, Chris. So, so everything will be on the initiative? Correct. Yes. <laughs> and that's a free service for municipalities. We don't pay anything to list it on there. Oh. All right, then, uh, does somebody, no, we already made a motion. All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Item number 12, which is the reports for the month of March 2024 with the police report presented by Chief Michael Carroll. Thank you. The report from the police department for March 2024, we responded to 2,288 calls for service. 60 of those were alarms, one of which was found to be valid. We responded to 59 accidents, 21 of which were reportable, and we drove a total of 19,555 miles. Uh, of the alarms, 45 of those received warnings. And we still haven't gotten anyone with a fourth violation, so the highest were six at the third violation for the year. We received 26 assists, or we performed 26 assists to other departments for a total of 18 hours, and we received 14 assists from other departments. And we performed extra traffic enforcement on Taylor Hill Road, West Town Road, Goshen Road. South Matlock Street, Grove Road, Nellis Lane, Snyder Avenue, Lincoln Avenue, and Rosary Lane. For career development, we did our normal monthly trainings, and in addition to that, Officer Ken attended acting and rank training, Sergeant Holman and Officer Graham attended hostage negotiation training, Officers Ash and Virgilio attended Aspen updates, which is the part of the traffic unit's um, crash updates. Myself, Captain Video, Lieutenant Cotter, and Sergeant Liz attended an FBI National Academy of Trainer. Officer Hero and Officer Manko attended FBI Intercounty Detective School. Officer Needham attended a marijuana medical marijuana workshop, and she also attended domestic violence compassion and action training. And we had a normal yearly range instructor day at the range to prepare for our range training for all of our officers for the year. So that's the report from the Park, but I'll certainly accept any questions you have. All right, thank you, Chief. Does anybody have any questions for the Chief? Uh, just one question on the, uh, the domestic violence, compassion, and action training. Well, what is that training? What does it equip the officer to do? So it gives them what kind of a, an up-to-date, what's going on in domestic violence. So there's two depends of it. There's always the safety issue for the officer, mm -hmm. but more importantly, an understanding of what's going on and providing empathy, trying to provide empathy in, in, in situations where you have to calm things down a little with training on do all officers rotate through that training over a period of time? Or? So the county officers it in different forms usually every year, and we said a couple of people, it's not it's not run multiple, or probably it's run more than once, but not over and over in each year, but it comes around yearly. Okay. But how about, do you think the majority of our officers have had that training over the last two or three years? I would not suggest that a majority have. I can get you a number, but I wouldn't think a majority. Okay. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, uh, for the medical marijuana workshop, um, has the technology advanced to the point where you're able to measure the level of toxicity of a person who's high from, mar from marijuana and that would make them capable of driving? Uh, has it reached that point yet? So the state has different amounts that if they're found in your bloodstream are illegal for different drugs. But the impairment level for, for the officer doing the investigation on the street, they're just looking for impairment regardless of what caused it. Okay, so it's like a subjective uh, determination on the part of the officer to determine whether a person's impaired or not, regardless of what is very And they're, they're given a battery of tests that have been scientifically tested to use to determine that, but yes, I'll they're going to make that decision on the street. And then once, yeah, assuming a blood test is taken, once that comes back, there's certain levels that if you reach, then, then you're considered impaired. Okay, how, how's the, uh, the two Patrick students? Two Patrick's are doing a great job. 
And to explain a little bit about the procedure, what you bring on new hires, I and mean, do they go through a probationary process or a period of time, or when they're assigned to a, another officer up in heaven's work? So their officers are on probation for one year, new hire officers are on probation for one year, but they go through an FTO program, a field training officer program, or they're assigned to a, a trained field training officer for whatever amount of time it takes them to be deemed ready to go out on their own. Um, it's usually about two months, so I expect if the Patricks are doing very well, they will be released sometime at the beginning of summer. But then they stay with those officers, their training officer, for at least a year, just kind of uh, as a mentor and monitor for that first year. I want their apprenticeship for you. Um, the other question I had was uh, with Thornberry, they're still not part of the video uh, regional system? They are not. Have you seen an increase in assist calls to WeGo to that area? No, we wouldn't really assist much in Thornberry. That's that's a substantial distance from the township point. Right, that's all right. All right, thank you. Any questions from the public for the team? Yes, it's right. Yeah, um, I, regarding, uh, and I feel the pressure in my neighborhood regarding noise and no noise ordinance and um, curfew and and, and kind of, I want to use the word content. Uh, I've gotten complaints, and, and they're just because people talk to me, uh, about cursing, primarily in rental, like rental areas uh, where there are students. I uh, know what you're speaking of. Kids will be kids. Um, they're allowed to do certain things, but in neighborhoods, where you have families and young kids especially, and kids are, as I get older and older, I understand how kids are more and more impressionable, you know, and the cursing and the language. I mean, where do we draw the line and how do you handle that, like, when a, a resident complains? We handle it on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Um, usually with a conversation. But, the resident, but a lot of the of the language you're talking about, if it's pertaining tenant, that's a different story. But if it's a couple of people playing games in the yard and some words come out, that's a different a different conversation. Gotcha. Understood. Thank you. I I, I hear you. Yeah, I don't know how to word that without. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's it's a valid I, I can feel the pain. Yeah. I try to give guidance, and it's just... It can be difficult sometimes. As a okay. mother, I know that's true. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Chief. Thank you. Moving on to item number 13, which is the Board of Supervisors announcements. I'm actually going to start to my right tonight. Mr. Walsh, do you have any announcements? I do. So on uh, March the 27th, I participated in a special meeting of the Pension Committee to interview three companies that were invited to present to the Pension Committee. Um, as I knew to ultimately present one of them to be our new investment advisory service for the Township Pension Funds. Uh, the Pension Committee will be finalizing its recommendation at um, the next regular meeting, which is next week, with probable, with possible Board of Supervisor approval at our uh, May 7th. A recommendation there. Um, I attended the PSAS conference between April the 14th and 16th. 16th uh, participated in several workshops. And I'll just list a couple of them. I'm not sure everyone's interested in the round table for townships over 10,000 residents, stormwater management project fails, sunshine law requirements, short term rental condi considerations, PennDOT multimodal, Pen multimodal transportation planning, which is useful for tonight's discussion, yeah. uh, EVs for municipal fleets and co-stars matchmaking suppliers and so I was able to talk to Mark about that. So that's my update. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Allman? Okay. Uh, Wednesday, March the 20th, I met with a resident of Warren Road about lack of stormwater drainage there and subsequently I followed up with the township manager and the streets department to address it. On Wednesday, March the 27th, met with the new Westchester Department uh, Fire Chief, uh, Mark Scanlon, and a few of his deputies at the Bay Firehouse, along with Tina, Marie, and I, and we got a tour of the facility. Uh, Thursday, March the 28th, um, Nate and I met with uh, Mark Ptolemy, and had the streets department for a bi-monthly liaison meeting. On Wednesday, April the 3rd, um, I attended a virtual meeting with the uh, Clean Energy Futures, I forwarded information there to uh, Council's manager. 
with information about uh, getting uh, applied for an energy assessment from PICO. I attended the land planning uh, committee meeting on April the 9th and heard a presentation from Penrose LLC about affordable and attainable housing. Uh, I participated in the West Ocean Police Traffic Committee meeting on Wednesday, August the 10th, and we discussed various traffic issues, one of which was about uh, where and when and where uh, police uh, protection should be provided for assemblies in our parks. We finally attended the PSATS conference uh, from Sunday, April 14th, we went to April 17th and had an opportunity to attend, work, to attend workshops with topics from uh, issues such as uh, the Ethics Act, the EV charging infrastructure, townships over 10,000, fire and EMS uh, best practices, as well as uh, zoning issues, just to name a few. And we also visited dozens of vendors, booths, uh, who supply services and equipment to the uh, townships across the Commonwealth and pick up quite a bit of information from them as well as content. Thank you, Mr. Allman. Ms. Smith? Uh, yes, on April 4th, um, I attended the Chester County Business and, and Industry Chamber. There's a speaker series on the business of energy and sustainability. And part of that uh, speaker series was uh, Pico Tom Bonner, and an energy company was also there. Um, what came out of that was um, I went up and talked to Pico afterwards, and they actually said that it, there's a lot of ways we can save money with our solar and also with our EV. So Chris and I are meeting with him, I think, next week to see how we can save more money uh, with some special programs they may have or um, other ways that we're not looking at. Um, on April 5th, I again I had a function with the Chester County Business and Industry Chamber, a subcommittee, which is called Municipal Government. And we're not looking for affordable housing, we're looking for attainable housing. And what that is, is um, basically young people that come here and they go to college maybe and then they can't stay because they can't afford to stay. Um, but one of the things I realized also I'm going to bring to the coalition is as I was touring with Mark Scanlon, the famed fire company, um, I thought what we could do is as another incentive for our firefighters is to see if this program goes through. Um, right now, my understanding is we spend about two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year on mainly the live-in students that live at the firehouse, and of course they're on call put out fires. Once they graduate, they can't afford to live in Chester County. So we we spent a lot wasted time, money, and resources on these young college students, and then they have to go on to move into another county. So if this program becomes to fruition, I'd like to have them another incentive to be eligible to be able to afford the housing in Chester County and be able to stay here. So it'll be another incentive for them. It will also be uh, help the township because we're spending a lot of resources and money into that. Um, so I will be addressing that with the coalition. Um, first, we have to see if it's, if it's even doable. So we're going around now looking at a lot of different areas within Chester County to see where this property could be, we, you know, we could start building on it. Um, and then also on April 9th, uh, I went to the Penrose LLC, which is more of an affordable housing versus attainable housing that they're looking to, to build one in the barrel. Uh, the PSATs, um, I went to a lot of sessions regarding the fire and EMS. Um, I learned a lot of things firsthand from a lot of knowledgeable people there that I think will help me moving forward and with the coalition too. Um, also EV charging, learned a lot about that there and a lot of networking. Um, and then last night um, I went to a trash and recyclable meeting with three other townships who have been doing this for one for 18 years now just to see if it would ever be viable for West Goshen um, to want to pursue something like that. Right now is not the time to do that, but we want to do our homework to see what it was about, what the cost, how the residents feel about it, what's the process so that we can at least think about it in the event we have to go that route in the future. Um, and then met with my Carol this morning to go over our monthly um, loose stuff. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Wallen? Yeah. Uh, March 28th, as uh, Mr. Hellman said, uh, we met with Mark Bartolome of the uh, Streets Department. Also on March 28th, I attended a webinar for the uh, then upcoming PSATS conference and attended the historic uh, commission meeting on March 28th. April 5th, uh, Tina Marie and I attended the Chester County Library System Legislative Breakfast. 
uh, April 14 through 17, we attended the, uh, the PSATs and some of the events that I uh, attended was the roundtable for townships over 10,000, Right to Know and Sunshine Act, and uh, supervisors have rights too. Uh, last night I also attended the uh, Council of Governments uh, meeting that dealt with uh, refuse and recycling. And just wanted to mention, I believe coming up on April 27th, we have the Arbor Day planning. So if anybody out there wants to help plant trees. Is that next weekend? Yes. Not this so. weekend, the next right. weekend. Yeah. There you have it. That's all. That's all for you. Okay, thank you. Um, I only have a couple other things. On March 20th, our Park and Open Space Steering Committee met. Um, I don't think I announced that last month. Um, and we had a good discussion to kind of kick that process off. We were in executive session on March 21st to discuss a legal issue. Um, we had our monthly meeting with our manager on March 22nd. And I attended a Cato meeting on March 28th in preparation for PSATs. And I was also at PSATs. So that's really all I have in addition. So. Thank you very much. And we will move on to item number 14, which is the township manager's announcement. Mr. Bishore. Hi, yes, Madam Chair. Cross two of these items off my list. Uh, okay. Uh, first item is our e-newsletter will go out next week uh, for the month of April. Um, I think it's probably going to be a fairly extensive article uh, edition. I've seen some of the articles already. Um, a uh, major project that is going to be coming up. There are two major projects coming up with PennDOT. Uh, we attended a meeting with PennDOT yesterday, correct, Brian? Yes. So they have two major projects coming up. The first one is in relation to, as the board will recall, there was an accident involving the bridge from Potsdam, over 322 from Potsdam Pike, right before, I believe it was right before Christmas, where a tractor trailer hit part of the bridge above that. Uh, PennDOT evaluated that and instead of replacing the beams, they're actually going to replace the entire superstructure of that bridge over Pot for Pottstown Pike over 322. Um, we just became aware of this two weeks ago. Actually, right before we went to Peace Hats. Yeah, wow. so like two weeks ago. Um, maybe, maybe even less than that. Um, so we had a virtual meeting, myself, representatives from the police department, Brian, representatives from the streets, streets department. Uh, they're going to be starting work, not really the full extent of the work, through on May, the week of May 6th is when they're targeting. Wow. And it, they anticipate it's going to be completed by the end of the year. There are no anticipated, Brian correct me if I'm wrong, there's no anticipated lane closures. They're just going to be doing traffic shifts. So they are going to be start to install the Jersey barriers and traffic maintenance protection of traffic measures, which is the Jersey barriers, the concrete barriers to set up for their, for their work zones. That's going to start their anticipated week of March, or sorry, May 6th. Then they're hoping to, by the end of May, beginning of June, start the demolition process. The project will take down half of the bridge, so two lanes shifting traffic on the one side of the bridge. There'll be no closures of Pottstown Pipe, but there will be overnight closures of 322 for removal of the beams. And okay. okay. it'll be done overnight. Wow. That has not been, that schedule's not been worked out. The final design hasn't been worked out. And the final detour plans have not been worked out. That's still being and, in progress. And once we have all, once we have those detour plans and the information, we will post information on the township website. There is an article that is, that we wrote that is going to go in the e-newsletter that goes out next week announcing this project. Okay. Yes. So they did stress that Pottstown Pike will not close. Will not close. Will yes. not close. It will be maintained two way traffic nice. at all times. That is really good news. So 322 will close, but it will be closed overnight. Overnight. And there will be signage and detours uh, posted in the, in the project location. And you said this would be finished by the end of the year, so it could be like a six month project, seven month project. That is what they're that's, targeting. That's what they're targeting. Wow. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's all subject to change and weather permitting. Yeah. Are the uh, on off ramps to 322 impacted? No, no. This is strictly the actual superstructure of the bridge, just the bridge deck and the beams. They're maintaining the abutments, they're leaving the abutments, it's just the beams and the bridge itself. Mm -hmm. But due to the nature and the age of the bridge and the, and the damage it sustained, PennDOT determined it's 
better for everybody involved to just replace the entire bridge where they're trying to repair it. Yeah. And they did state in the meeting this is the second time the bridge was hit in its life. Oh gosh, so, really? And the project will actually raise the bridge higher. It'll be more, the new beams will be a less of a, of a thickness. The webbing will be as, they won't be as deep. So I think they're gaining approximately there were six to eight inches of additional clearance under the bridge. Oh, okay. And it's done. The, exactly. other, the other project that PennDOT is going to be completed, completing upcoming is also along 322. It is the slope uh, repair project that was damaged during Hurricane Ida. Um, if you drive on 322, you'll notice concrete barriers that are providing a wall that will they're pretty much there to protect people on 322 from the failing slopes. So they're going to go in and they're going to repair that. Mm -hmm. That is the other project. And again, that's going to be starting relatively soon. And it, it's another project that they're targeting for completion at the end of 2024. Okay. Yes, there's a chance that they'll be running concurrently. The, the Ida project. We have no, uh, just to be clear, we have no start date on that project. Okay. But the slopes is like the they're earth? Fair. Yes. They're failing. How do they go? Oh, I don't know. They're, they're going to build a they're going to build a protective wall to a wall a wall to protect from them. Mm -hmm. Like a what's it called? Like a retaining like wall. Like a retaining wall. Yes. Yeah. So if you drive down 322 heading from Putts Putts down Pike, you're driving on the new asphalt, and yeah. it turns gray. And there's the concrete barriers that are kind of partially in the lane. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the area right here that had impact of from Ida that washed out the face of the, of the road. That's why this. So this is, this is the area that's going to get rebuilt and then that's all going to get repaved. That project is anticipated to kick off at some point this spring. They gave us the, the link to their website, it just says spring 2024 for that project still, which is a date given. Okay. And this project is also in, going to be in the e-newsletter with a link to the press release. But again, there's no start date that we have at this time. And again, no road closures during the day because um, of this you project? Know, be, at, what, at certain times, there'll be a one lane pass from there because of equipment. Okay. They'll use um, they'll use flaggers yes. like they did in the past. <coughs> and that's going to be a the same six time month as the project? Yes. Same so time frame. They're, they're, they're going to be running concurrently, which is not ideal. Okay, so everybody avoid 322 for the rest of the yes. year. Yes. We don't, again, we do not have a start date. As soon as we have more information, we'll put it up on our website. But right now, all we have is that this is a project that's coming and it should be completed by the end of 2024. All right. And, and there will be an article in the newsletter that goes out next week. Okay. Very good. Um, our EV infrastructure project is completed and closed out. I actually believe on the bills list tonight is the final payment uh, to Hobbs and Company. The project's completed. Uh, and I have contacted PICO to begin the process so that we can get the reimbursement that we filed for last fall. So I reached out to PICO yesterday and I'm waiting for what we need to do to submit. But all the closeout documents have been sent back to Carroll Engineering to provide their contractor. Great. So they did a good job? I mean, did they did it work out okay? There were a few issues, but generally they did okay. Um, but uh, there, were no, there were no change orders with the project except for one for the contract duration just because it got delayed due to the weather that occurred this winter. But other, the price came in at the 152 that was awarded. And what did we budget for that? Yeah, we budgeted 200000 I believe. Okay. Um, the second May board meeting is going to be shifted to May 22nd. Um, uh, and I will post the information. I believe I've changed that on the website. If not, I'll do that tomorrow, and there will be a legal ad that runs. Right. So May 22nd at 6 p.m. Steve, you got that? Steve, you got that? <laughs> yes, actually. Put that on my calendar now. Make sure I have it. I'll send around, I, I sent a confirmation to the board already, yeah. but I will send around a reminder. Yeah, okay. uh, we have two uh, recycling events coming up. Uh, the first is our shredding event, which will be this Sunday, uh, the 21st, here at the Township Building from 9 to 12. So it'll be a shredding event, and then there will be an e-waste event on April 22nd, I believe also from 9 to 12. And that information is up on the Township website. Generally, we did them together, however, we couldn't schedule everything concurrently, so we have to separate it out over two weekends. Can people bring TVs to the e-waste, or is that a different? I'm not 100% sure. They can? Yes. Is it listed like, yeah. on the website, right. that, yes. like, what's included? Yes. yes. Is it like computers, phones, TVs? Here's your, here's your flyers on your website. All right. 
So you're shredded that. And this obviously is shared on social media. Uh -huh. yeah. It's Sunday the 21st, and then here's the recycling. And I just that will not be accepting air conditioners. Air conditioners are dehumidified. Yeah, I think computers, hard drives, CPUs, LCDs, TVs and monitors, printers, computers. This is not appliances, that right? It is. It is? Uh, no, no, not appliances, I'm sorry. Like you can't bring... The wash and dry. Yeah. In your car. But you can bring, I like have a... Can you bring a microwave? I have an eye in this plug. Oh, it says yeah. with a plug. Yeah, 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 it says appliances, small appliances. Any with small plug. appliances with a plug. Yep. Right. So, you can, you, so you can bring like a range, you can bring a microwave. Like an air fryer or a toaster oven. Yeah, okay. Yes, that's your thing. Um, this right here just is the press release website for this Ida Slope. And it still says here's their scope of, scope of work is listed. And it says construction is just going to begin early spring of 124. They haven't given, they haven't even updated their website more than that as far as the date of construction for the well, early. We know what's coming. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, our community yard sale will be May 4th, uh, 2024. Um, I believe then there's information on the township website about registering for the community yard sale. Um, and then finally, our two final things, both related to Arbor Day, our Tree City USA flag that we received last year has been placed in Community Park. It is over by the gazebo, um, so that is that has been placed. Um, and then finally, uh, PICO has selected West Ocean Township to be the site for their Arbor Day tree giveaway. So they're doing that on um, Friday, uh, April 26th in Community Park from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. People can come and collect fruit trees from PICO. I think you have to apply first because I did that one year. You have to go on, on their website because then they, they want to know where you're planning it and they should, it's a whole formula. Okay. Yeah. Based, they're based on where the sun is and how much property you have. And but they are doing, they, are, they selected, they contacted us earlier this year and wanted to use the West Ocean Township Community Park as their location. And that's our actual Arbor Day, right? Correct. It's the final Friday in, in April. Okay. Madam Chair, those are all my announcements for this evening. All right, thank you very much. So then we'll move on to the Township Engineers stormwater announcements and we'll move to Greystone update. So I have a couple updates for stormwater. I'm currently working with DEP, and I will be meeting with HRG in the 1st of May to address comments we received back from DEP regarding our permit renewal. Um, there is some questions they have that we need to look deeper into our peer to plan to, about, to answer. So that is a meeting with HRG on May 1st. I scheduled that meeting today. Our MS4 permit. Yes. Which we applied for in March. Okay. So they get they, they contacted me Wednesday before PSATs with questions. Mm -hmm. I responded to what I could. Went back and forth while I was at PSATs with DEP via email and now we've down to the point where I need to get HRG involved because it's questions about some technicalities in the PRP that they prepared. Okay. So I'm meeting them on May first to go over that. Do we have an agreement with the HRG services? I don't know. Really wait for them this year. I don't know. No, we didn't get a specific proposal for them. From yes. Them. So once I meet with them and we go over the comments, if there is a PRP update required, then we'll get a proposal done for the PRP. Okay. So they were the ones that sold it. That feed, though, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. They've, they've offered to meet with me to go over it. Okay. They offer. They offered the meeting with me. Yeah. Um, that's the first stormwater update. Second stormwater update is Emily and I attended the uh, Esri. Not Esri, sorry. Esri is the is the software. Yeah. The PAGIS conference Thursday and Friday last week. We learned a lot. We're meeting with our Esri representative Monday afternoon to go over our account to see what we really actually have and, and make sure we have the account that serves us best. That's, that's Monday the twenty second, um, and that we did pick up some few things that we can do for our MS4 and better work, but we need a better product of a higher level of what we have. So that's why we're meeting with them. Additionally, stormwater, I've been um, responding to several um, inquiries from residents regarding pipes, regarding flooding, regarding stormwater. So as they come in, I'm, um, I'm listening to their, what they have, taking information and doing research on what we have here before I go back out and meet with them. So I do have a meeting next week on Cloverly Lane. I've called a resident Monday morning and scheduled that meeting with 
um, there's no more questions. Thank you for doing that, Brad. That yes. means a lot to residents when you actually go out there and talk to them. So I'm doing that. I'll, I don't know if I'll meet him next week or not. Um, additionally, Woodlands of Greystone, I did get an email a lot of PSATs from the engineer request asking how many sets of plans are required for the submission for phase six. So I'm assuming because that email came in that they're working on getting the six, the 10 sets of 500 pages of plans or whatever it's going to be, they run and they want to get them submitted. So I expect that application to hopefully come in and be before the planning commission at the meeting for acceptance in May, but it depends on when they submit. Um, and additionally, I'm meeting some homeowners on Tuesday the 23rd to discuss the, their concerns with the trees and the buffering behind their houses and the, and the buffering that's required by the conditional use and land to complain that 20 foot buffer. There's residents that don't want it, they want the buffer to be gone. Yeah. Where's this at? Woodlands of Greystone, the, Woodland, the 55 and older. I'm going to join you, Brian. Yeah, so they actually, actually offered to come to meeting with me because it's, as of right now that I know, it's going to be four different homeowners meeting with me at once mm -hmm. out there. Is there a particular street? Uh, street? Skull for it. School. Yeah, it's going for it towards Ashbridge. Oh, that's small. Is that? Uh, no, it's further down, but it's down towards, it's not directly where Ashbridge is, but it's further to the, closer down towards the bottom of Skull for down the hill. There's people that are complaining that they don't like the trees that are in the buffer they want to remove because they don't like the way they look. Okay. Yes. Um, that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions for me? Is there an update on the, uh, the dams that were, that were you authorized? Yes, I have the report, and Chris and I discussed we're going to uh, not issue a report until it's asked for by the, until I meet and it comes it becomes part of the punch list for. RLD, when they request the money, they don't give them the report. Okay, so they have requested the money to release from the damn jet. And you, but you've got a list of the punch list items basically from that report. Yes, the report's very thorough. Also, not only the good punch list items, it also gives maintenance suggestions of how to maintain it. And just so the board's aware, all the costs for that have been included in the escrow release for the specific account for Greystone to pay for professional costs, and we have received the reimbursement checks for that. Oh, good. And the revised plans for the quality and redevelopment came in Friday. Okay. So they're under review by Carol Engineering. Okay. That's good. So you revised with what? So my last letter, the last, the recommendations for approval that you guys did conditional had some, they still had some outstanding comments that they had to address. Whether it be, um, there was like the land, the you know, legal descriptions weren't provided. Okay. There was, it was minor stuff. They had to give us an escrow amount. We had to review an escrow that came in. Just some minor stuff. Nothing major. Nothing just major. the minor stuff at the end. It was the conditions of your resolution of approval. They finally submitted Friday to address your resolution from January. Okay. Any other questions from the board for Brian? No. no. Okay. Yes, Mr. No. Two things. Um, could you add green beer to your punch list on stormwater? My son bought a house there last year. And his house is a beautiful storm break. Doesn't go any there's a complaint form on the website. Please fill it out so we can track it because I won't remember it. So there's there's a complaint form. He fills it out, submits it, and it'll get to me, and then I'll follow through the channels that way. Okay. And the second um, question is: um, Is there any more movement on the roof roof project uh, on, that goes into Gay Street? The traffic light. Well, PennDOT was going to start that project. I thought that was a targeted 2025 project. The Route 3 project. Wasn't there, isn't it called like a road diet or something? No, that's that. That was paled. The Route 3, the light at Route 3 that they're putting in is going at the ramp at 202. Yeah, that's yeah. part of that project. And in that project, we had the. We did have a meeting with PennDOT about that. Yes, and um, they're, they're looking to, I think, start that in 2020. I guess they, they might actually start some of it this year. It was kind of unclear. But I think the bulk of the work is going to be 2025. Yes. And I do remember when they came and presented to the board back in 22, early in 22, they were looking at a late 24, early 25 start time. Yeah, and that's mostly striping, closing off crossings. On, and the only light that I'm aware of in the project is the light at the end of the 202 south ramp on the roof right. And they were going to replace. They were going to replace the flashing signal that's currently there with a full. They were going to remove the flashing signal that's currently there because they're putting that light at the end of, at the end of the ring. Good. If that doesn't do anything. It seems like it doesn't work. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, uh, Brian. 
Is it, regarding agenda item number four and Snyder Environmental, that methodology of lining the storm, the storm drain? Yes. Is that a new process? Or no, that's been around for quite a while. I, I've i done a project myself as an engineer for different township back in 2018. Okay. So, are, um, there, are there limits as to what you can do, like length yes. and no. terrain? Length, yes, because they can only get some. It, it's limited because the reel has to fit in the steam truck. So the bigger the pipe, the bigger amounts of the reels, so the reels get less length on it. And it's limited to how big they can do. Right now, Snyder is the only <coughs> one, only contractor we're aware of that says they can do 30 inch. Most guys will only go up to a certain size, maybe 15, maybe 18. They won't get to the 30 inch pipe. Snyder is also trying new product out in the larger diameter pipe. But they, the, the, the test was the day after we met with them, they said they let us know how it goes. Since we didn't hear from them, we assume it didn't go well. Because it's, it's the, it, you're, you're basically pulling it up, you take a, think of taking a PVC pipe and heating it so it's flexible, crushing it in on itself to make it like a tube, pulling it through it, and you blow it back up. Well, you have five minutes from this time to start pulling that pipe to get all the way through and blown up, or it's too hard and it. And it's diameter and length are, are factors. Yes. yes. Okay. So, and it's a specialized material, it's called Novoform, they use. Uh, Tina Marie asked, and Ashley and I looked at a product up at PSATS that's different. Now, I don't think the woman was right what she was saying, but it's a chemically cured product. It's yeah. not air cured. This is chemical. So it's pulled in into, it's chemical. But she said it, it turns itself inside out. It, I don't know how a pipe through yeah. a long can turn inside yeah. out. Inside I, thought out I didn't think it was right either. I think it was right, but it's, it's a chemically cured. So it's a product that uses chemicals to cure it versus a product using so steam and air. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a chemical reaction that of that pipe versus this piece is actually inflated with air. Yeah. So they're different pieces. Which is and, interesting. I mean, we'll explore that in the yes. future and see if so it's a good product. That's, but yeah, it's been used for a long, long time. And what's really nice about it is you don't, have to do, you don't dig anything up. Yeah, digging is expensive. Well, also it's destructive. And time consuming. This, I mean, they said they, they pull their longest pulls that Stutter can do is pretty much just depending on the size of the pipe, the smaller pipe, they can do up to five or six hundred feet in one pull. And that could be between multiple structures. If it's a straight line, they'll start at one end and pull as far as they'll take the reel and just run it right through the manholes. And then they cut it in the manholes after the pieces are done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ryan. And we'll move on to item number 17, 616. Any watches our zoning officer's announcements? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Smith couldn't be here this evening, so she prepared a memorandum for the board. I'll highlight some of those items uh, in her absence. Uh, so for the zoning hearing board, they met um, back in March uh, to hear case number 01-2024, which was for the shopping center for the requested relief associated with signage. Um, uh, and all testimony has been completed and the hearing was closed on April 1st. Uh, decisions going to be rendered at their scheduled meeting on April 22nd. Uh, there are no new applications before the zoning hearing board. Uh, there are three land development applications currently under review, which are 1052 Andrew Drive, um, which is the intended use of the property is to construct an office slash shop building with a parking area, storage areas, and stormwater management. There's a project at 21 Haggerty Boulevard, which is the Goshen Leisure Development. Um, that was received on March 5th. Uh, the application is an amendment to a prior land development approval, and the amendment to the land development involved a modification to the parking lot area around an existing building, which necessitated a change to stormwater management. Brian and Shelby and I did meet with the applicant. Was it? No, it wasn't the applicant. It was a potential buyer. Potential buyer about mm -hmm. two weeks ago regarding this project and maybe a new maybe useful was originally intended, and that's what's going to shift the parking requirements. Yes. Uh, and finally, 920, uh, 800 East Virginia Avenue, sorry, I was reading the property owner's name. Um, this is a land development application that was received on March 15th, and it's at 800 East Virginia Avenue, and the application is for the construction of a revised warehouse building with parking. So this is also an, uh, this is also an amendment to a previously approved land development application. Um, just so the board is aware, at the May 7th meeting are going to be two, sub, two subdivision land development applications that are coming before the board. 
Uh, the first is a hangar expansion project for the Brandywine Airport, which was at the Planning Commission meeting on April 9th. And the second is the subdivision for 315 Powell Lane for the footpath that the township will acquire. Oh, yes. So that will be that will be May 7th. Yeah, also to follow up on the 800, if you have, this is the piece at the end of Times Avenue that Shrine was doing. It came before the board at the beginning of 2022 and in 2021, sorry, end of 2022. This is when you guys have looked at it because this came through right as I was hired. Um, the East Virginia Avenue? Yes, this is that warehouse that Eli Khan brought through at the end of their expand, widening Times Avenue for the warehouse. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So now they bought the first property next to them coming up Kind of Avenue. They own that now. Not the residents. Yes, the first house. The they residence. purchased the resident. They were put. They in, bought those people out. That were the first one. The first one coming back up Kinds from their property. The last house down on the right from Kinds that's now existing. They own. Yeah. Okay. And so because of that, they take they've made the building bigger and taken out the buffer from that property because they own it now. So they've okay, come back. But they, now aren't they next to another resident anyway? No, because that, that house is staying. Right. The house they own is staying, but the uh, previously approved plan had a very large buffer yes. between that house and where their building started. Okay. Their building before was set up differently. This building is set up as a long um, multi-use or mixed-use building where they can break the centers, break it down into smaller pieces. So it's 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 not as deep on the site, and the, there's no the loading docks are much much smaller. So there's it was very very far in the building. It's only loading for I think there's four over there. So, so they changed is, it, and so now they need to come before us again. Yes, because they they already recorded it, so now they're amending what they recorded. Yeah. Okay. And so it's a new application. And then just a few miscellaneous items. Uh, the first one is for Kia of Westchester. They submitted a sign permit application to install wall signs on the building and a freestanding sign along West Town Road. Uh, the application was uh, was denied. Uh, specifically, the proposed freestanding sign. Um, due to the height, and uh, it's not within, it's not 25 feet from the right of way. The applicant the denial to the zoning hearing board within 30 days or by May 9th or seek variance relief. Uh, the university temporary housing uh, ordinance was approved by the board on April 2nd, um, and no application has received has been received at this time for con a conditional use hearing before the board. So we're still awaiting the conditional use for the temporary housing that was approved by through that ordinance on. Is there any time period that that needs to be submitted, or can they mm -hmm. kind of just do it when they? They can do it at their leisure. Back. The ordinance has been adopted. They just have to wait the five days for it to go into effect for the second class township code. Yeah. Interestingly enough, after this meeting, I did run, run into Mr. Nagel in the grocery store, and he told me that he was working on it. Oh, good. Okay. Small world. Yep. Um, and then finally, there have been a lot of questions posed to different regulations that we don't currently have um, ordinances for, such as the keeping of animals and short-term rentals. Um, so we're at the exploratory stage and reviewing with myself and our solicitors what needs to be done for those items. Okay. Uh, within a couple of days, we got questions regarding falcons and horses. Mm -hmm. um, and we currently don't have any regulations related to those. Um, so we're working with the solicitor on those items. Okay. Um, so those are the zoning officer's announcements for this evening. All right, thank you very much. And now we are on to... Any update on the, the 901 South Walmart Street application? The last I had, I had heard was they were submitting a revised plan. And that would, have to, that would address any of the concerns related to the provisions in the I-2 uh, zoning district for buffering requirements. Um, we have an extension through June yeah. 6th, I believe. I had a meeting with the applicant and their engineer with their zoning officer, and they showed us a new layout of that and to cook them how they were complying with the 100 foot buffer. And they just wanted to make sure that they were complying with the buffer before they went full board. And, and they are. They're complying as much as they can because if you have 100 feet to a building and the building's 100 feet, there's still going to be potential disturbance right at that face of 100 feet to get the building face in. Mm -hmm. So yes, the building is set 100 feet from those property lines now. Okay. On the sketch plan they showed me. So that will need to, since that's a significant revision, that will need to go back to our planning commission and we are going to need to check with the solicitor to see if it'll have to go back to the county planning commission for further review. Yes. If that we, do, we do have an extension on the time clock through the first meeting in June for the board. So there is still some time on that. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, item number 17, the approval of the Board of Supervisors meeting minutes of March 19th, 2024. Are there any 
major changes to the minutes that just have one on page six down. Uh, this probably made a motion to approve the stormwater pipe agreement. Was there a second to that? Is it that was? Hmm. That's the only, only question. There oh. would have been a second, and it should have been. Yeah. And it was Ms. Smith. So I will, I will make that change. Thank you, John. Any other major comments? No? Okay. Then is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes from March 19th, 2024? Thank you. Thank you. Any public comment on the minutes? Hearing none. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries. Item number 18, which is the approval of the treasurer's report dated March 31st, 2024 for the general fund, the sewer revenue fund, the waste and recycling fund, and the capital reserve fund, and the bills to be paid from these funds. Are there any questions or comments about the treasurer's report and the bills to be paid? Um, I had one. These pages are not numbered, so I don't know how to, how to reference. I guess it would be the manual bills on the first page. Mm -hmm. um, reimbursements for damaged tires due to stop sticks. $299.41. Just wondering what that is. That is from a pursuit when you stop sticks and try and stop the fleeing vehicle and innocent person ran over them. Oh, um, an innocent person ran over them? Yeah, like spikes on the road? As well, so yeah, can you we don't justify the we don't get it. The fact that that committee gets breakfast every every month, three hundred dollar breakfast every month. They need it. That's something that started before I was here. It's actually, every month, it's I was on here to ask them because I questioned but, but it. These special meetings that we're inviting and present is for our investment advisor mm -hmm. looking after our forty million dollar pension fund. Yeah, so we give them a copy of the bagel. $300 every, it was on their ASMO, two of them was on their ASMO. Well, hold on a second like now, because we've also been hosting the consortium meeting, so there are bills to associate with Panera for the consortium meetings that we host with Manager's Consortium, and we do buy breakfast, and those are reimbursed to the township through the Manager's Consortium. So when we get those bills, um, I send those to the Secretary of Treasurer, and he reimburses us for those costs. So those get reimbursed. The pension committee meets once a quarter, and they meet at 8 a.m. So that kind of started. The board, that started way before my time, and actually used to get a catered breakfast with like all sorts of stuff. I just think that it's inconsistent. We have committees that take time out of their everyday lives to come in and be here for the township. It doesn't matter what time of day you meet. You're taking your own time and you're coming here. And I just think that if we're paying for a $300 breakfast for one committee at once a quarter, it just seems inconsistent to not either do the same for the other committees yeah. or to just get rid of it. If the board would like as a policy decision to stop providing breakfast, then we can stop doing that. That would make my life a lot easier. We don't even get to eat we have to meetings all just, day. Just one point that they at least we've got three or four people who work and come in. I, I understand that, Sean, but that's also their that's their choice. choice. And there's a lot of other people that do that. And we also well. have other people on other committees that I know have missed work to be at meetings that are important. And I'm just saying it's it's not it's not you know fifty bucks for donuts. It's a three hundred dollar. That's a lot of money. It's well, that's two. That's two. Well, let's just check in to see what the cost is for. What do you get for? I don't have a problem with that. Bagels and coffee. So then but we it's have weird now, it doesn't even been excessive for a meeting. If you want to have a meeting at 8 o'clock, have breakfast for any, any place that want to meet at 8 o'clock, I would support that. Well, what about people that meet uh, at dinner time, which is when a lot of our committees meet? Should we buy dinner for everybody then? I think we should talk about it. I think it needs to be on the agenda. I think, I think we need to talk about getting rid of that. Yes. Not that we don't appreciate people, we need to be fair. Good dollar man, not to achieve a man, something like that. I don't know. We have to have it for every committee. 
could has it during lunch hour, dinner hour, or breakfast. Every committee would then once a quarter, which I think is actually a nice thing to do. Maybe not even once a quarter, maybe. Well, maybe once a quarter. But then we should do it for everybody. Once then we a should quarter. do it for everybody. All committees once a quarter. I'm with you, Tina. I'm just, I just like consistency, that's all, because I don't want any issues or problems, because I appreciate and respect everybody that's a volunteer in this township. I agree, and I wish I could give everybody something for it, but I can't. We can't play favorites. Okay, so we can add that as an agenda item. Make a motion to approve the bill. Thank you. Yes. Is there a second? I will second that. Thank you. Any comment on the bills to be paid? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. I'll I'll motion. And I will second. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Chief.